Welcome to a special meeting of the Northampton School Committee, Wednesday, October 23rd, 2013. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz, and we'll begin tonight's meeting by asking the clerk to call the roll. Mr. Alden Moore? Here. Ms. Blue Duvall? Here. Present. Mr. Michael Flynn? Here. Mr. Danny Meyer? Here. Ms. Lisa Minnick? Here. Mr. Howard Moore? Here. Mayor David Narkowitz? Present. Ms. Stephanie Pick? Here. Mr. Here. Mr. Edson. Present. Thank you. So the purpose of tonight's uh, meeting is to conduct interviews for the position of superintendent of schools uh, for the Northampton Public Schools. Uh, we have an agenda that's been posted. Um, we'll be conducting uh, uh, interviews with the three finalists uh, that have made it through our, our search and screening process. Um, then following those interviews, uh, the committee will recess. Uh, we will have then, we will then have an opportunity to read um, and review uh, the several surveys that have, were collected at the meetings held earlier. Uh, uh, th these come from parents, community members, PTOs, school councils, administrators. Um, and then the uh, schedule is to uh, come back into, um, out of recess, for some deliberation um, about the interview process and our thoughts on, the, on that. Um, and then um, we do have scheduled on the agenda, or at least we have it um, uh, on the agenda, the possibility of a vote. But obviously we'll have to see how things proceed to when we get to that point. Um, as to whether the committee um, is, is ready to take a vote at that time. I thought it might be useful to, by setting the stage for this, ask uh, school committee member um, Pick to just quickly review um, the screening process um, as, it, as it happened after the screening committee was appointed and working with NESDEC. Sure, thank you. Uh, so we've been working with um, our facilitator Joe Wood from NESDEC, who is the facilitator that we used during this process two and a half years ago. Um, we had a wonderful committee, a working committee of 12 people that involved um, uh, administrators, staff, parents, community members, and school committee members. Um, we um, got together, we def defined our process, we looked at, um, we had uh, 16 candidates who applied. We chose six to interview, and we have brought three forward to be finalists, um, whom we will be meeting again with tonight. Um, one of the things that we did at the beginning of our screening committee process is um, we reviewed this uh, the profile that we had written, and I thought it would be a good idea just to briefly read that to you tonight, just as a reminder of what it is that we are looking for. And this is the, the profile that we all wrote um, two and a half years ago. The future superintendent of the Northampton Public Schools should be a leader of exemplary character who demonstrates the highest level of professionalism. He or she should be a good listener who seeks out the opinions of others before making significant decisions. The candidate's experience should reflect the ability to anticipate the need for change, make research-based decisions, and use that research to explain why a particular path forward is the best option for the district. As a strong, forward-thinking educational leader, he or she will work collaboratively with others to develop a vision for educational excellence for the Northampton schools. The candidate will be able to communicate this vision effectively to both the internal school community and the community at large in order to gain broad-based support for the realization of this vision. He or she will build partnerships within the community and advocate for the resources and support that Northampton schools need. The candidate's educational background should indicate that he or she has acquired the depth of knowledge to successfully lead the central office and administration. His or her professional experience should include classroom teaching and successful leadership as a principal and or central office administrator. She or he should have had substantive experience in developing and managing budgets similar in size and scope to Northampton's. As an experienced educational leader, he or she should be able to successfully collaborate, build consensus, delegate to others, supervise and mentor staff, and make sound decisions. The candidate should be able to use technology effectively as a means to manage the system, facilitate innovation, and enhance communication. The candidate should value the, cons the views of others, demonstrate willingness to work cooperatively with other leaders in the city, and possess a proven ability to identify and implement innovative solutions. 
he or she must be knowledgeable about and value the unique qualities of Northampton, respecting and embracing the diversity found within the community. Thank you. Um, anything else you have to say about the process? Just a reminder about, uh, do you want to do that, the reminder about? Um, if you'd like to. Okay. So I know that we all know this, but just as a reminder, um, we, whether or not we choose any um, individual candidate, we are speaking about three very professional people. And we are doing so in a very public way, on camera, in a way that where the record will follow them for the rest of their professional career. <coughs> so I remind us to be um, very thoughtful in the way that we make our comments when we deliberate. Um, and to remember that um, the candidates and anybody who follows their careers um, are able to hear what we are saying. Okay. And just in terms of the, the how, <clears throat> how we'll be conducting the interviews, uh, we have a series of questions that, uh, that you all have um, that were predetermined, and they've been assigned to each one of the members. Um, and I, as we go through, uh, we will um, rotate to each one of those members who've been assigned the questions to ask the question. Um, and then uh, uh, following the response, uh, I will indicate who the next person is to ask a question. Um, and, uh, and obviously, we have allotted um, an hour for each one of these interviews. Um, so I will try to be also mindful of the time, uh, 45 minutes, and try to be mindful of the time. So um, I. I believe we are ready to begin the process, um, so I will introduce um, the first candidate, uh, Timothy Lee, <coughs> who's here with us. Good, good evening. Hello. Good evening. And, um, and the opening uh, question uh, for Mr. Lee uh, will come from the Vice Chair, Mr. Zahowski. Good evening, Mr. Lee. Nice to see you again. Uh, I have the opening question that's uh, it's a little bit more involved than the one we asked you during the, the screening committee. So if uh, you need me to repeat it, please feel free to ask me once again. Uh, you've had a chance to see some of Northampton and learn about our school department. Please describe for us what your entry plan would be as the new superintendent of school. Could you please try to be specific in how you would develop a plan of action, whom you would include in that task, and how you would communicate your plan? Um, well, first of all, let me say I've really enjoyed visiting all the students today. Uh, you have a tremendous asset in the uh, teachers and the staff that work in all the buildings, and um, I. Uh, really enjoyed uh, seeing the different culture and the positive uh, things that are happening in a lot of the different schools. Um, entering uh, the school system, I think uh, the first priority I would have would be to get to know on a closer level the administration and the faculty of all of uh, your schools. Um, and uh, the reason that this comes up first for me is I think uh, before trying to identify any uh, priorities or initiatives, uh, I think it's really important to build trust with uh, the faculty constituents within the district. Um, I'd make the same effort to get to know uh, the um, bodies that uh, help to uh, contribute to the school governance, the school councils and the PTOs, and um, uh, so that they can uh, understand me as uh, a leader who is open and participatory. Uh, so establishing trust would be my first order of business. Uh, secondly, uh, in my plan, I would uh, begin to, uh, with key staff from the administrative team, um, the curriculum coordinator, um, special education director, I would begin to uh, identify what some, some of the academic um, priorities are for uh, the coming school year. Uh, depending on when I would enter the district, that might change a little bit, um, but um, uh, uh, suffice it to say, I think that uh, entering in the middle of the year, uh, affecting change that would be able to take some root and take some traction would be uh, quite difficult in the middle of the year. So I think I'd be looking more ahead as I identify priorities for the academic programs at the various schools. Um, 
Thirdly, uh, depending on when I enter again, I think I would be entering uh, during uh, a busy time in the budget season. So uh, first order of business would be to familiarize myself with the budget process in Northampton. Um, spending quite a bit of time with the business manager, uh, learning your process, familiarizing myself with the calendar, key dates when things need to be uh, done and accomplished. Um, and, uh, of course, familiarizing me, myself with the opportunities and limitations that would come along with the school department budget. Um, so developing trust, uh, beginning to prioritize uh, academic directions for the district, and promptly uh, familiarizing myself with the uh, budget process. Um, and then, uh, as a fourth priority, um, I think what I would like to do is uh, get into the schools as much as possible. Uh, just to be able to understand in a more in-depth way uh, the challenges and the successes that the teachers and the administration are facing as they, um, as they do their business in our schools. And, um, I can't think of a more efficient and effective way to do that than simply to be there and watch uh, in a number of different settings and places uh, how that works and how that works for different children. So those four steps primarily would be uh, my first um, um, step into the school, uh, the action steps that I would take coming in. They might vary a little bit, again, depending on when that entry would be, uh, but I see those as uh, the four uh, first steps for me. Thank you. The next uh, question is uh, <coughs> Mike Flynn. Good evening. Uh, how will you assess the effectiveness of the current curriculum? Describe the process you would use to make changes in the curriculum, including how you would oversee implementation of the changes, and what role does assessment play in the process? Well, um, one of the primary tools that we have to assess curriculum uh, is student performance on the MCAS. Um, there are other indicators uh, that would show success, such as uh, input from uh, receiving teachers in schools um, at the transition points in the school district. So middle school teachers uh, giving feedback on the success or needs of elementary school students when they move up to that level. Likewise, high school teachers feedback when students move from the middle school level up to that level. Um, so MCAS, teacher feedback, uh, certainly the feedback from principals and special educators, special education administration. Um, we know that in uh, Northampton currently, uh, the data would indicate that uh, in the elementary school at least, uh, performance in mathematics uh, is below the state average. Uh, in uh, almost all of the schools, with a couple exceptions at certain grade levels, uh, and if I could use that as an example as how I might proceed, I think that one of the first things to discuss when assessing why um, an academic program or instructional program might need to be improved is why it's not producing the results that we would hope it would. And uh, that's a large conversation had with many people, certainly the stakeholders who are the teachers who use the programs, those instructional programs. Uh, the principals who understand the, um, um, the schedule and uh, the uh, amount of time and the resource uh, benefits or restrictions that teachers might have in rolling out those programs. Uh, so in mathematics, my discussion would involve all those parties. And uh, so we'd get to a point, I would assume, where we would be looking at either um, um, adding to uh, supplementing, uh, providing more professional development, uh, or um, uh, discussing a phase out or phase in of a new program. Um, all of this would be discussed with input from the uh, teacher teams and the folks who work with these programs. Uh, again, I'm using <coughs> mathematics as an example because it's, uh, as the data would show, as the data would suggest, it's one of the probably the most obvious uh, questionable uh, areas right now in the elementary school <coughs> curriculum. Um, so it's, it's mainly a question of identifying and coming to some, some consensus with all the stakeholders that yes, the, there is an issue here. We could be doing better with this. Um, and I think that discussion would happen first. Second, um, 
going over uh, the curriculum itself and finding the uh, benefits and uh, the areas where perhaps the curriculum is coming short. And that can be done with analysis of the data itself. Uh, the data will show us if we break it down into items, what sort of, uh, which standard areas the students are not performing well in, which sort of test items they're not, which populations are not doing well. And we can tease all that information apart and get some good information about how to respond. Uh, but it's a, it's a process, process that needs to involve everybody's voice and uh, but it's also a process uh, that includes a lot of conversation, I think, that has to be had. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from uh, Mr. Downey Meyer. Mr. Lee, how should professional development be connected to evaluation of teachers and administrators? Professional development connected to evaluation of teachers and administrators. Um, I would think that professional development is um, connected in two ways that I would answer off the top of my head. Uh, the first way being that there should be an expectation on the, uh, on the part of the district that uh, professionals engaged in, the, in, in teaching and learning every day should actively always be seeking a means to improve their practice. Uh, so I think there's an assumption that uh, professional development should be active and ongoing part of every teacher's practice. Um, now, the caveat there is that it's also the responsibility of the school district to provide opportunities for teachers to participate in those professional development activities. Uh, but certainly, um, and, and let me just back up a second, uh, related to educator evaluation. So let me finish with my second thought. My second thought on that is that, uh, of course, um, with any system of educator evaluation, uh, there will be uh, feedback coming out of that process, feedback directly to the teachers. And the feedback can assume, uh, in many cases, that there's something that um, teaching staff need to work on. And so a result there would be that uh, the district um, and uh, principals and the administration of the district need to keep kind of a running tab on uh, how many of our uh, faculty members are needing or requesting professional development in one area so that we can effectively set up those opportunities. So with regards to educator evaluation, I think it should be an expectation that all professionals are always seeking opportunities to improve their practice. Um, and if they're not, hopefully that would be reflected uh, in an evaluation. Uh, and then from the other end, uh, the evaluation itself will indicate a need for um, uh, more work in one area or uh, perhaps um, an extension of uh, professional development to focus on a new uh, curriculum program. And again, I think that's something that the administration needs to monitor to make sure we're able to provide those opportunities efficiently. The next question is from Andrew Shelfo. Hi. Can you please describe the ways that you believe technology can be used to enhance academic achievement? And how have you used technology to enhance individual student achievement? Um, there's many different uh, sort of venues or, or areas that technology can be used as a tool by teachers or by administration or by students. Uh, teachers can use technology to uh, uh, present instruction in a more um, interactive way to a wider group of students. And here I'm talking about the use of uh, uh, smart boards, tablets, uh, projectors, um, multimedia, um, just a way to uh, extend and make more engaging the teaching process. Uh, students, um, there are so many ways that students can use technology. Uh, I tell you what comes to mind first is uh, just the ability of uh, one student with a simple iPad to be able to access um, a 10,000 book library of uh, leveled readers that um, they can find in either fiction or nonfiction in whatever uh, area that they would look uh, to read in 
and um, it's right there on the table, instant access, and um, without the building of resources that you would need to create that many books in a library. Um, another thing that I found very useful uh, in the use of technology is to present students with activities that solidify some of those more, um, I would say, day-to-day -day skills in some academic areas. And uh, as an example, at my current school, we have a whole suite of uh, software applications that we use in grades one through five to uh, allow students to practice their math fact fluency. Um, programs like IXL Math and uh, Rocket Math and uh, they're engaging and they are ways that students can actively practice those, uh, um, uh, those skills um, in a way that doesn't require a lot of preparation but still covers that important component of the math program. Students get older, again, uh, the um, potential for technology to be a research tool is huge. Uh, to be a communication device uh, as an assistive technology device, uh, that's huge as well. Um, as a way for students uh, who are writing or creating projects or presentations in the upper grades to share uh, what they have learned in a more effective and, and, and engaging way with uh, their teachers and fellow students. Um, those are just a few of the ways. Uh, the, again, uh, there's some conditions that need to be in place uh, for this to happen. You have to have uh, the infrastructure that supports it. Um, you have to have teachers that are interested in using it. And um, you also need to um, be certain that some uh, safeguards and procedures are in place to see that uh, the technology is properly used by students. Thank you. Yeah. The next question will come from uh, Mrs. Lisa Minnick. Would you take this opportunity to describe your most rewarding accomplishment and what it means to you? My most rewarding accomplishment? Uh, in education or otherwise? You choose. Okay. Um, One thing that I'm very proud of is in uh, August, uh, I completed work on a house that I've been building for three years. Um, it started off as an idea I think I had many years ago, and um, uh, it was a project uh, probably three years in the planning, and then another year in the preparation and uh, site production. and. Uh, permitting and then uh, actually the construction started in 2011 and um, it was uh, it's been pretty much my only pastime for the past three years it's occupied everything uh, finished the house in late August just in time for some tenants to move in and uh, very proud of the way it turned out it feels good to uh, put effort into something for an extended period of time like that and see a product at the end. Uh, it felt very satisfying also to be able to help out the family that was moving into the home. Um, so there's other things, and I could talk about education a little bit more, but I'd say in the in the recent future, that's probably Did something that I feel. swung a hammer, or were you just I, I a general contractor? For swung the hammer, I cut the wood, put on the roof. Yeah, I did it all. Um, I get to have a follow-up question. Uh, if, if you could now tell us about a challenging situation you faced, this one does say in your career, mm -hmm. and how you addressed it, uh, the result, and what you might have learned from it. Um, well, probably about, about five years ago when I first came to Morris Elementary, where I'm now principal, um, the principal who was there prior to me had been there for 26 years and uh, much of the staff in the school were uh, veteran staff and um, the culture of the school in terms of um, teaching and learning was one that rewarded individuality amongst teachers uh, which has its merit but at the same time the result was that we did not have 
um, consistent instruction between grades and certainly not within grades. So one of the challenges that I had was to try and, as the new person, uh, to try and convince people that this is a direction we need to head in. We need one, and I started with phonics because that seemed to be the most glaring thing that we could work on first. And I said, we need one core phonics program for our entire school, grades K through three. And um, we had some takers who I was able to convince early on, and then we had some folks who just you know weren't interested in hearing that message at the time. And uh, so it took, uh, uh, the, the challenge here was selling uh, the idea that we can do things better as a school if we all get on the same page and uh, work on the same things together. And, um, and there were, as I went into my second year there, I had some more converts and some more people that uh, after seeing the materials and using the program and piloting some things, were beginning to be sold, but we still had some holdouts. Uh, and um, I remember the way that ultimately turned out uh, was that uh, the, the very few holdouts that we had, um, another piece of background on this is that previous to my arriving at the school, the previous principal had tried to do this twice. I had tried to implement a new curriculum in reading and reading and ran into uh, problems trying to bring the whole group to consensus about which program to use. Um, and what ultimately led me to the, uh, in the direction that I wanted to go was that um, I, I just purchased the program and uh, had the boxes delivered to my office and then uh, met with the teachers who uh, were my two ultimate holdouts and um, when they came down to meet in my office they looked around and they said Ooh, what's this? And I said, well, this is our new phonics program. We're going to start using it next week. Aren't you thrilled? And uh, so at that point, I think it dawned on them that, uh, yes, this change is going to happen. But change, uh, change uh, is always um, a big challenge in education. I, I think that um, for, for so many reasons, but uh, I think that um, People, uh, teachers, uh, professionals are, are very creative and personal in their craft and uh, the effort that they put into creating and developing instruction and, and the care that they put into their work with children, um, it's, it's very meaningful to them. It's their baby, it's their, it's, it's their work. And um, we have to approach very delicately and very carefully when we say, it's time to try something different because this isn't doing it for us. And we have to be very careful that we don't say, um, you're not doing it right. Uh, because indeed they are. Uh, it's just that we, we, the priorities have shifted. So are they, are they all on board now? Yes. And, and what exactly did you learn from this situation? Mm -hmm. I mean, you said that we have to be careful. You have to be cautious. You can't step on their toes. I learned that. Um, I learned to be patient, uh, and um, I learned that ultimately uh, a leader has to make a decision that's going to stay made. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I actually have the next question. Um, describe your process for arriving at budget priorities using some examples of unpopular or difficult budget decisions you have had to make in the course of your administrative career. Um, budget priorities, I always, um, in my school budget and working with the school district, uh, it always begins with um, an analysis of staffing. Uh, and that begins with an analysis of the enrollment. So how many students are we going to have? How many teachers are we going to need to have to provide the staff that we need? paraprofessionals, uh, special educators, so learning as much as we can about the students so that we can ad accurately project staffing needs. Um, then um, I left out one part. Um, capital uh, comes before staffing usually in my budget process, but that's kind of a separate process in the operating budget, at least it has been in my uh, experience. Um, and then um, the next step for me is always uh, initiatives. So what new initiatives are coming that we need to be prepared for? 
um, and what sort of financial impact will they have on the budget. Uh, try to assess what that impact is going to be and then work it into the budget figures as well. And then uh, last, I get down to stuff. Uh, stuff are the supplies, the materials, the pencils, the textbooks, all the material things that we need to support us in our work with kids. Um, and I usually put that last because that seems to be in the budget process where I have the most ability to be flexible and to cut if I need to. Um, so that's how I begin, and that's kind of the process that I move through in assessing what uh, our school's budget is going to be. Um, and then a decision that, um, a situation that I've been in, uh, there was um, four years ago, um, there was an individual at our school that was a, uh, her title was that of uh, enrichment teacher and she mainly provided uh, services to students to kind of support talented and gifted interests. Uh, I found out that she was retiring at the end of the year, um, so instead of choosing to um, refill the position, and I had a couple people interested, um, I chose to hire a reading specialist instead. And at that particular time, we needed somebody to help our teachers move through some new curricula and bring our school into a more sort of modern uh, time when it comes to gathering and interpreting data uh, for student growth. Um, our reading specialist did that for us. And, uh, uh, but parents, um, staff members, uh, other members of the community still wanted that position to be a part of our school. Uh, we just couldn't do it because they're, they're, we didn't have the resources or the funds. Um, there was another time that uh, two years ago, we moved from half day kindergarten to full day kindergarten in our district. Uh, we needed to do this because the Common Core now requires that kindergarten be a pretty academic place. Uh, and uh, the half day just wasn't enough time for the kindergartners to be students and be kindergartners to have social time and play time, uh, which is also important. Uh, so at that time we had world language at our school. We were offering two uh, at different grades. Uh, I cut one, uh, cut a bus route, um, made some other changes in staffing uh, that were unpopular, but, um, and I was able to get the full day kindergarten in uh, with only $10,000 or so between um, my budget target and what the district was able to do for us. And that $10,000 I made up of other programs, uh, part-time staff, and uh, so that, that's two examples of school priorities, budget constraints, and ways that I've uh, worked to make them happen. Thank you. The next question is from Mr. Howard Moore. Well, hi. Um, the question is, as superintendent of the North Hampton Public Schools, what would you see as your role in defining the district's vision for educational excellence? Can you repeat that, please? Sure. As superintendent of the North Hampton Public Schools, what would you see as your role in defining the district's vision for educational excellence? Um, well, I think that, um, I would certainly be a, um, a coordinator of uh, let, me, let me back up for a second. My role, my role would be to, um, I think, first uh, inform all of the constituencies, communicate to all of the constituencies within the school district um, that we need a vision for excellence and um, or that we need to refine a vision for excellence within our schools. Um, in terms of who devises that, um, I think it is a group effort um, and that all of the parties, all of the teachers and community members and school councils, school committees certainly uh, all have a say in what that vision for excellence is. So uh, from that perspective, perspective, I think that my role would be to gather up those different community voices and to try to put them into a cogent message. I've been through, uh, 
our school district currently is going through a strategic planning process and uh, it's been quite a um, quite an operation they decided to contract with an outside uh, agency to come in and do the strategic plan and uh, it has been um, a matter of lots of focus groups and lots of uh, uh, inquiries made of students faculty staff and uh, I think the only thing that might be missing in such a process the way that they've been doing it is some input on um, where the school stands with its performance data. And they haven't really inquired a whole lot about that. And I think that that is an important piece of information that would need to make it into a vision of excellence. What would our target be for performance in mathematics and ELA and um, um, uh, grade 10 uh, MCAS uh, if, um, uh, if we were fulfilling that vision that we had for excellence. Um, does our vision for excellence mean that we become a level one district? Um, those sorts of questions uh, kind of framed from a perspective of school administration I think would also be an important um, contributing factor to determining what that vision would be. So I think my role would be first to inform uh, that um, this is a opportunity for the entire community to uh, set some goals about what we'd like to accomplish in our school district. Um, a second role would be to uh, collect information from all the different constituencies about what they would like to see. Um, there'd also be a communicator role in there for me in terms of educating people about where we're at currently. and then hopefully to try to bring it all together in a way that uh, uh, we would find consensus around that and also uh, it would be a realizable uh, vision that uh, the school committee, the town, uh, we can all get behind and support. The next question is from Mr. Alden Bourne. Good evening. I think you may have already answered this question partially, but I'll throw it out there anyway. Um, how would you work to gain support for the Northampton Public Schools, and what groups would you focus on, and how would you get them behind us specifically? Um, yeah. Well, there's, there's a number of different constituencies that, that have a stake in the public schools. Um, parents are probably, uh, you know, clearly the important group students. Um, our faculty members, the school committee, uh, business partners and community members, um, that's, those are the groups that I, I think I continually target as I reach out for support in, in terms of our work in education. Uh, the one thing that I'll add to that that I didn't say before though is that you know when um, you reach out for support or when you reach out for uh, some sort of uh, backing on an initiative, um, it's essential to first have a plan of what you want to accomplish. Um, so a vision uh, or a strategic plan needs to be somewhat specific uh, if you're going to be able to have people sink their teeth into supporting uh, a specific idea. Um, again, I think the, the, the example that I'd probably call on in uh, Northampton is the example of mathematics instruction in the elementary schools and up into the early middle school. Um, going into uh, kind of a, uh, a staff and uh, administrative team assessment of what the issue is, um, working up a plan about what we're going to do with it. Uh, the plan has to be reasonable, doable, and show some likelihood that it's going to attain the desired outcome. Um, there's been times where I've been part of processes where we've gone out, we sought support from the community, or we sought funding support, and it wasn't really clearly identifiable what we were trying to do. Uh, so I think it's essential that whatever you aim to accomplish needs to be clearly spelled out to all of those groups that you want to talk to. Thank you. Okay, uh, for the next question, uh, we're back to uh, Mr. Zahowski. <coughs> Could you share with us what uh, is the perception of your leadership style in your current district? <coughs> uh, perhaps um, from parents' perspective, school committee, um, students? Um, I think that uh, 
all of those folks uh, see me as a approachable uh, and open kind of leader. Um, I think they see me as a person who will listen and um, I think that they know me as a person who really wants to understand what the concerns and issues are. Uh, typically if I don't, uh, I'll ask a lot of questions until I do. Excuse me. And um, I think students, um, I think students like me. Uh, I think uh, I like them a lot and um, I think that uh, you know, some of the work that we've done at our school around trying to create a positive school culture just by doing simple things like uh, greeting one another and shaking hands and some of those things uh, has really made an impact on some of the students and they've kind of modeled themselves on the model that we've provided. So uh, I, I like to think that uh, uh, I've been a model for them in that way. Uh, I think parents see me as someone they can go to with an issue and um, I think they see me as somebody who will listen and will um, attempt to um, answer their concerns. Um, but I also have found that um, parents have been pretty good with me when uh, I have not been able to meet their every need either. Um, so I think I can communicate well to let them know that you know there's there's a realm of possibilities that we can uh, put in play to. Uh, do what you would like us to do. Um, I think my coworkers and my um, supervisors would um, see me as a collaborator and a um, uh, a person with uh, creative ideas about how to solve problems. And um, I think that um, I don't know. I think that sums it up. Okay, the next question is uh, Ms. Blue Duvall. Hi. Hi. Looking at your resume, could you explain the professional choices that you have made along the way? Sure. Um, I started as a um, Spanish teacher in uh, 1989. Um, I have a real interest in Spanish. I'm bilingual in Spanish. and. Uh, uh, loved the language when I started studying it in college, so I decided to make it a vocation. Um, and the way I chose to do so was as a teacher. Uh, I was a teacher of Spanish for six years. Um, and then uh, at some point during that time, I began to have an interest in uh, school leadership um, with some ideas that I thought I could put into play that would make for more effective schools. And at that time, I um, uh, was teaching at the Cambridge Public Schools in Boston, excuse me, Cambridge Public Schools, and um, they had a fellowship program available to teachers in Cambridge and Boston called the Conant Fellowship. I applied um, and I was granted a, um, a, a favorable scholarship that allowed me to get a administrative certificate at uh, the Graduate School of Education at Harvard. Um, shortly after that, um, I wanted to work as an administrator and um, found a job in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. Um, it was about the same time that we were expecting our first child and my family lived close by and uh, so that uh, was a good circumstance for me. I was three years as a middle school assistant principal and then an interim principal. Um, and about the time uh, my daughter came of preschool age, I began to take a real interest in elementary education. And an opportunity came open to me to work in a uh, sort of a progressive uh, alternative independent school uh, with mixed age classes and a thematic curriculum. And um, it, I thought it a good opportunity to learn a lot about the way young children learn and about the way we teach young children. Um, I was there until 19, excuse me, until 2003. Uh, and in 2003, um, at the urging of my wife, uh, we decided to move back east. And at that time I found an elementary principal position in Norfolk, Connecticut. Uh, and then five years later, one a little closer to home in Lenox, and that's where I've been since. Uh, so most of my career decisions have been made 
in an interest to uh, learn more, uh, I guess I would say, um, with the exception being my move from Norfolk, Connecticut to Lenox. That was purely a uh, kind of a logistic and convenience move that uh, worked out a lot better for my family as well. Okay, and then to follow up that, um, what do you think has prepared you to be the, su to, to be the superintendent of the Northampton Public Schools? As a administrator in small schools and one school districts, um, I have had uh, quite a bit of autonomy uh, to make decisions about the way uh, our school does things and quite a bit of autonomy to make decisions about the way I manage my own school. And uh, when I was in Norfolk, uh, the school was the district, so essentially, um, um, I, the budget was my budget in that one district. Um, in terms of becoming a superintendent of a school district as large as Northampton, uh, I, I, I'm not uh, hesitant to say I think that's going to be a real challenge for me. It's going to be a real leap in uh, uh, my uh, skill set and a real stretch to um, be able to um, carry out the initiatives on such a wide scale. However, the, the prospect of doing so and having an impact on such a um, uh, wide group of students and uh, a diverse place like this, it, it's really interesting to me. And I think that my preparation in curriculum and teaching um, to a certain extent finance, uh, I think uh, I, I can say without hesitation that I feel up to the job. Thank you. You're welcome. And the closing question is from uh, Stephanie Pick. Hello again. Hi, welcome Stephanie. Back. We've had a long whirlwind day. So I have the, the last question. Just now that you've spent some time <coughs> in Northampton and have met some administrators, staff, families, school committee members, what have you specifically learned about this community that would draw you here to be our superintendent? Well, I typically think when I think about what makes um, a great school where, uh, and a great school system where students can come and they can learn and grow every day, I, I, I think pretty simply just about two things. And one is about uh, providing the best instruction that we can provide every day to all of our students. The second thing is um, creating a uh, school culture uh, that is welcoming and that uh, um, makes all of the students who attend the school uh, feel safe and ready to learn and teaches them uh, through modeling, you know, what it, what it means to be uh, positive in your relationships with other people. Um, all of the visits that I made today to all of the different schools, to all six schools, showed me that uh, in the second category, uh, making a positive school culture, uh, n this is a priority for Northampton. And um, I saw evidence in every school that I visited that um, all faculty, staff, administration, uh, they put a lot of thought and a lot of effort into making all of the students feel like they belong and they're welcomed as a part of this uh, school and school district. Um, so that's one uh, reason I think that I'm uh, feeling so drawn to this now, especially after my visit today, that uh, I think that there's a real alignment between that priority uh, that clearly the faculty and staff have in Northampton for that positive school culture and the importance of that in students' growth and learning and my views on, on that uh, important issue as well. Um, and in the area of uh, uh, instruction, I didn't get to see a lot of teaching and learning in my brief visits today. Uh, and uh, I did mention before also that um, you know, what I do know through research of the district's data, that there are some areas that, that need to be examined, in my opinion, uh, uh, that, that uh, are not uh, insurmountable challenges. Uh, and I think that with um, a focus on uh, curriculum 
and providing interventions for struggling students, uh, providing professional development support for teachers. I think that there is a lot of uh, growth and improvement that is possible, very possible for uh, the schools of Northampton. And uh, that also is a very uh, enticing professional challenge for me, to be a part of that and to have uh, a positive impact on that change. Um, again, is something very interesting and exciting for me. Thank you. And finally, do you have any questions or concerns for us about our community? Um, a couple observations that maybe um, someone can shed, shed some light on. Uh, there have been uh, a number of superintendents uh, since 2002, uh, six, I believe. Um, is there someone on the school committee that can comment on the turnover in the district leadership and uh, perhaps why it's been a difficult position for uh, superintendents to have, if it has indeed been? looking in her direction because she has the longevity. Uh, I've been on the school committee for I think it's my 22nd or 23rd year so I've seen many of those come and go. I think some of the ones you're, to whom you're referring may be interims okay. but we've had um, I think in some cases it's the pendulum swing uh, so when, when you start looking for a superintendent, they go, what is it that you want? You go, well, we either we want something that's vastly different than what we had the last time, or we want the, what we had the last time plus these other things, mm -hmm. um, or we want what we had before, please, please be a clone, of, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so it's been, um, it's been, and, and I'm sure you're aware that school committees change. We've also had a lot of initiatives come from the state over that period of time, and and I think that that uh, you know I would say that there have been some extenuating circumstances in some cases to, that that have led our superintendent to leave us. I mean, our most recent one was not something we would have predicted, and there have been a couple of others along the way that we wouldn't have predicted losing a stu superintendent for those those reasons. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wouldn't at all say that this is a, that we're hard to get along with or that this is a difficult district or that we have, I think, I think you've seen some of what the challenges that we're facing are. I, I, I think that, I, I can tell you that in this particular search, people have said to us that they are looking for someone who will stay they're looking for someone who knows and understands this area mm -hmm. and wants to be part of it mm -hmm. and 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 um, sort of accepts and embraces the challenges that come with the, and and finally I would say that our finances have just you know there's a, we we don't have the money to compensate someone the way we would like to be able to and so we accept that there's a temptation for people to go elsewhere so all of those things I think have played into the the uh, the transitions that we've gone through but we would we would be happy to have someone stay here thank you okay okay so that concludes our interview thank you very much thank uh, you. for uh, for that break until we have the next candidate come in. All right. so. I want to thank you all for the opportunity. Good evening and welcome back to the special meeting of the Northampton School Committee, October 23rd, 2013. Uh, we are um, we've just completed our first uh, superintendent candidate interview. Um, we are now uh, going to be interviewing uh, Mr. John Johnson. Welcome. Thank you. Um, and uh, we'll be asking you a series of questions that are assigned to each of the members. Um, and I will call upon uh, the vice chair, Mr. Zahowski, to ask you the first question. Good evening, John. Good evening. Uh, you've had a chance to see some of Northampton today and learn about our school department. 
please describe for us what your entry plan would be as the new superintendent of schools. Mm -hmm. Could you be specific about how you would develop a plan of action, whom you would include in that task, and how you would communicate your plan? And if you need me to repeat that. Nope, not at all. It's actually an issue I've thought about a lot. Um, and uh, I, I thought I saw almost all of the uh, schools. <laughs> I did see them all. It was a good day today. Um, it's, uh, it's great to be in Northampton, and uh, it's a very important question that um, I think all, anybody who aspires and who takes on a superintendent's role needs to have an entry plan. Um, I've actually worked out I, my thoughts are on that. Uh, one important, uh, the first important aspect of it really is to build um, a positive working relationship with all the folks at this table. Um, the school committee and the relationship of the superintendent with the school committee is vital. It's got to be part of the entry plan. The entry plan, to back up a step, I think needs to be something that your next superintendent, no matter who that person is, uh, works out with you, um, that it's a public document, um, that it's a document with a beginning point and an end point. Um, I, I think that it needs to be, uh, another aspect of it needs to be, um, the superintendent needs to develop a shared uh, understanding of the district, um, district strengths and challenges. You do that, um, I think, by going out and listening and engaging and seeing what's going on in uh, Northampton schools. Um, also going and talking to community leaders, community forums. I mean, really, the, the, the first few months of an entry plan would be um, getting that understanding of the strengths and challenges uh, facing Northampton. Um, another important aspect of that, and that's, that's part of the visibility, I think, of whoever the next superintendent is, is building trust and gaining um, I guess gaining a commitment from uh, school and community members um, that the district challenges need to be addressed. Um, whoever comes in as superintendent will um, need to uh, work um, on helping folks understand their context and their core values. And um, that's all part of that trust building that has to happen right in that entry period. Um, Right now you have a 2013-15 district improvement plan. There's some serious goals in that plan and there's some serious work that needs to be taken, you know, that, that can't stop, I think. Um, that's something that the next superintendent needs to work into their entry plan, needs to ascertain where that is right now, needs to make sure that um, as they're going around um, and looking at what the needs are, and what any challenges and also the strengths are um, that are being addressed by that plan, that improvement plan, that they identify for the next fiscal year um, strategic actions and align the resources that are needed to carry that out through conclusion. Um, I think another final piece of what a new superintendent's entry would entail would be um, really establishing a management structure and management processes and practices uh, within the district office um, and within the district that, uh, that supports what is the most important thing here, which are students in classrooms and the teachers that educate them. And so it's those, you know, the fundamental processes that that superintendent will um, work within in the super district and the central office is important in the entry plan. And as I said, the, you know, all of this is a public forum. I mean, education is fundamentally public. Um, I appreciate especially, you know, the Commonwealth here has a huge value. Northampton has a huge commitment to public education. And, um, and the entry plan is a means for you as a school committee and whoever becomes your next superintendent to work through in the short term getting there. The next question is um, from Mr. Michael Flynn. Hi. Good evening. Uh, how will you assess the effectiveness of the current curriculum? Describe the process you would use to make changes in the curriculum, including how you would oversee implementation of the changes, and what role does assessment play in the process? Well, I think one, one, one of the core values I have uh, as a leader um, in education is you know, that 
that you really need to focus the organization, the system, on continuous improvement that's based on um, data and also based on a focus on the results. Um, when, when you talk about curriculum, um, there's all kinds of curriculum at play. I mean, I, I was at six different schools in classes, numerous classes, um, which would be in the area of FIED, in arts, reading instruction, um, all different kinds of reading instruction uh, in terms of levels, in terms of approaches used to meet the students where they are and move them on. Um, in the AP chemistry class, um, you know, so, and I can go on. And so all those different curriculum areas have um, different um, ways and approaches that are important. Uh, I, I guess I would say the first thing that I would look at would be results and data. I mean, the critical thing for Northampton schools right now, I, I, you know, in terms of looking at your results and data, really are mathematics at the elementary level um, and really a continued focus on improving literacy. Um, and you know, your, your reading education uh, at the elementary level, um, in particular. I, you know, it's when you look at um, what is happening with the curriculum, you need to engage the practitioners, the folks who um, really are in the classrooms, and the folks who uh, who really are the ones that we trust and uh, you know and, and hold responsible for carrying that out. The other the other important thing I think that a person in a superintendency um, needs to, I guess, understand and realize is, uh, you know, part of working through systemic improvement um, is that, uh, you know, not all the uh, not all of this rests on teachers and principals. There's a big piece of what needs to happen, including reviewing curriculum, that that really rests on. Um, on the actions that the district can take systemically. You know, you, you look at school improvement plans. Um, those, those drive what the focus is for the year, they're annual here. Um, but there's also a district improvement plan. And there needs to be uh, consistency in terms of you know, the organicness that each individual school looks at what their needs are and identifies improvement um, strategies is important. But there needs to be a consistency in terms of there's a matching of what the district vision is within each school, which you need entity, and that there's support from the district level for principals and teachers to get that done. So I think that's also important in the curriculum area. Uh, the, the final thing I think in curriculum, you know, again, and I, like I said, curriculum is such a broad thing. I mean, there's you know, numerous areas uh, that you review in curriculum. The other piece of that is identifying textbooks to be uh, adopted, and there's a there's a need to engage parents and, at some level, students in those conversations. Um, you know, some of the, our students and parents know, in a lot of respects, if the curriculum is rigorous enough, if it's serious enough that it's actually engaging and moving them forward. And that's part of, I think, what a curriculum would, review would do. The next question is uh, from Mr. Downey Meyer. Uh, Short question. Good evening. How should professional development be connected with evaluation of teachers and administrators? I think the uh, an important piece of professional development, um, the, the connection to the evaluation of teachers and administrators, is really to. Um, it's not the gotcha moment of evaluation. It's got to be the build you up moment of practice. And so I would look to building administrators um, and I would look to the superintendent myself, I hope, uh, to provide principals and to provide teachers in the classroom with, with specific um, and focused evaluations that give them um, an understanding of what their needs are uh, within the context of their teaching practice, and that the conversations that are held with educators and with principals can then move on to how are we going to address this through professional development. Um, now, there is, I think, certainly a need when you look to uh, take elementary mathematics, for example. 
when you look to advance elementary mathematics in Northampton schools, that's a systemic type of professional development. When you look at individual teacher evaluations, there may be systemic pieces you want to add in. Let's say mathematics uh, might be for that third grade teacher an important piece instructionally. Um, but there are also maybe um, individual things, uh, you know, like you're you know, revolving around challenging students to the to as far as they can go within the classroom context, or supporting uh, English language learners, etc. That um, maybe somebody that's identified for that one particular teacher or administrator, which then you can work through professional development for. It's, it's the other piece of that is I think, so there's in-house, organically grown professional development that can be school-based or district-based. There's also calling on the resources of the community, you know, the resources of the, uh, uh, of the regional, you know, support professional development here, the uh, resources of uh, different um, uh, colleges and universities around. And, and part of, I, th I think, the principles, but really a lot of the central office um, responsibility would be um, to, to be able to build those relationships and to be able to, um, to make sure that, that Northampton schools knows where they can go for quality professional development. You don't want to buy a bad product when it comes to making the best teachers. The next question is uh, from Mr. Andrew Shelfo. Hi. Hi. Can you please describe the ways you believe technology can be used to enhance academic achievement, and how have you used technology to enhance individual student achievement? Well, technology is uh, is vital right now. I'd say, um, you know, one one thing I think about in terms of education, we we don't know what the future of education looks like. But we really do know that it's going to involve technology, um, whether it's one-on-one -on -one instructional uh, practice, whether it's a full classroom using technology, whether it's online learning um, for both teachers and for uh, um, students, whether it's uh, a resource that students can go out. I saw some three different three different schools today, um, students working on um, publishing. And uh, you know, working on computers, publishing, but also doing the important pre-writing exercises of gathering information and gathering supporting data for their thesis or for whatever topic they're working on. Um, and that requires a, a couple of things to happen outside of that classroom moment. Uh, part one of those things is it requires good professional involvement for educators. Um, because technology can bring a lot of vitality to the classroom when it's used wisely. You know, putting, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a small piece of technology, but putting data projectors in classrooms without any kind of interface, without any kind of functionality that's been provided for the educator, it's, it's, not, as, uh, it's not as vital a tool. Um, so it needs to be really good professional development. Um, but on the front end, there needs to be investment um, in decent technology, which also includes infrastructure uh, for schools. Um, that, that's important. But again, it's got to be investment that's wise. It, it's always tough, you know, if we had all invested in Apple 25 years ago, you know, we might not be sitting here tonight, but I think hopefully we would, because we all believe in the common good of schools. Um, but I say that because we think about what is going to be the opportunity point in schooling with technology, and part of that's guesswork, but you try to make the most educated guess you can when it comes to making that investment. Is that good what you're? Thank you. Thank you. The next question uh, comes to you from Mrs. Lisa Minnick. Hi. Hi. Would you take a few moments to describe one of your most rewarding accomplishments and what it means to you? Um, well, first thing that pops in my head is uh, uh, marrying a fantastic woman 20-something years ago and having three great child children with her um, and, uh, and watching them grow. Um, professionally, um, I'd say a couple things. One is um, when you come to, you know, and I, and I made a choice to come to education 
I didn't go to education school um, uh, for undergraduate. Uh, I was going to be a diplomat, and um, I saw a light <laughs> somehow uh, when I actually was tutoring uh, recent refugees from El Salvador um, in Washington, D.C., and changed my whole path. Um, I, I think what the, the, the context of, uh, of our legacy um, is often in the futures of the students that we either teach or that we're principal for or that we're superintendent for. The last 10 years, I've been fighting a good fight for public schools um, and advancing, uh, I think, a decent reform agenda um, uh, focused on kids. Um, and, and those, you know, those things are, are lasting legacy. I, I'll tell a couple of uh, kid stories. I mean, one is um, I, one of my first years of teaching um, had a student, I created a new program for kids with learning disabilities. I was learning coordinator at the school, and um, high school. And student um, came in, uh, really needed all kinds of uh, study skills help, uh, needed some support uh, for some of the content areas they were, they were working on. Um, that student uh, later on wanted to become a teacher, so wrote a recommendation for college. Um, that student later on needed help. Um, you know, we, we do a lot of testing of people who have become teachers, and they needed help because they had a hard time in the praxis. So, you know, help steer them towards some help with the praxis. Um, later on, student uh, was, was debating whether to leave the classroom to become a principal. Gave me a call um, to be an assistant principal. Later on, the student became a principal right near my house, um, and called me up to come visit and to go uh, tour his building. Um, and he was one of the only African-American principals in the whole city of Madison. And that, that's the kind of thing that makes you pretty proud. Um, another, the other piece though, and so that program I started that's still in place 20 years later, uh, the person I hired to take it over after I left is still there. She's expanded it. They serve 100 kids now out of a school, out of, a school of about, about 650. Um, those kind of legacies are important too. The systemic things you can do. I started a, uh, a program, a credit recovery program um, at Madison West High School where it was geared towards uh, kids who should have been sophomores and juniors and seniors um, who had uh, pretty much gone the path of uh, disengaging with school and, and dropping out or close to it. Um, and the goal of this program was to provide a broad spectrum of options to re-engage them into schooling, but also to engage them into work, into some sort of substantive job experience that they can get credit for, and also um, get some life experiences and some drive for. Um, so started off hiring a, a teacher and a social worker. That's the other key component to it was having the social worker um, really work on um, beyond the job placements, really work on um, their, you know, what sort of family issues there might be, what sort of other types of issues there might be. The, uh, the options we gave them, we would uh, help them engage in a couple classes during the regular school day. This, this program was open from 3.30 until 6.30 at night. Um, a lot of online instruction as well as some small group instruction with the teacher. We then, uh, we, that, that also allowed a bridge to, there was a night school program for high school kids almost completing, who didn't want to go to day school and were almost finished, but, um, but really you know, they wanted to get a job. They wanted to you know, do something different. You know, they're 17, 18 years old and uh, you know, it's, day high school wasn't for them. So that program went for another two hours and gave an option for more credits. So we were able to build this um, successfully run it with a couple staff, engage in existing programs, and, um, and it's a program that's been replicated at all four high schools, and it's still in place today. So that's, that's some good news, and I hope, I hope it's helped. I mean, the whole goal is, uh, is really to do things that, that really advance kids into adults. Thank you. Um, I, get to, I get to ask a second question, too. Hmm. Um, now can you talk about a challenging situation that you've had during your career 
how you addressed it, the result of it, and what you learned from it. I'd say one challenge, um, I'll fall back, I'll go, I'll, I'll do one at a, as a building level administrator. Um, I, uh, the, the, the district um, was really interested in moving, this is the 90s, really interested in moving to cross categorical programming, which for you know, those of us who don't live and breathe special education services means um, instead of having teachers specifically assigned and only working with students with learning disabilities, students with cognitive disabilities, students with emotional disabilities, and all the other types of ways that we divide and, and, uh, and label, um, you would build the ability, the, uh, um, either through teaming or through um, shared caseloads that, that teachers could work together and collaborate together and be cross-categorical. Um, so they could meet the needs um, or be able to access uh, the ability to meet the needs of a broad gamut of kids with disabilities. So this was, you know, it, it, this is a high school with, um, I, was running, I was running a lot of stuff, but one thing I was running there was special education programming. There were 25 special education teachers, um, about two or three um, speech and language clinicians, and about 30 um, special education ESPs. Um, and went to the faculty with this, uh, worked through with them what's out there in terms of research, which that was at the time, what was out there in terms of models at the time, had folks go and look at some models. Um, and this, this was a really good, uh, good staff that liked to innovate. They'd, they'd already innovated and become a model for transitional services for 16 through 21 year olds with disabilities. Um, and my ask that first year was, who wants to help me pilot this? So it, the idea being, in a collaborative process, you can build trust and you can build, um, you can take some folks' ability to take risk and then broaden it with the success of a pilot into, um, into a change for the whole program. And so what we did is we did the year-long pilot, um, had a lot of success with, you know, we basically took a person who was trained and had only taught kids with learning disabilities, cognitive disabilities, emotional disabilities, put them together. Um, as part of this, I reconfigured where people were, had them share space, had them share um, caseloads, and had them share um, uh, ESPs. And uh, after, you know, the, the, the important piece of a pilot, you can't just do a pilot and let it sit for a year. You get to report back to all their peers. We did that, we, uh, we then um, kind of wrote it up how it would work the next year, did a lot of planning for the next year, did a lot of professional development, you know, for the, you know, because you get, when you want to move people forward, you got to provide them the skills. And um, that was a real challenge. I mean, th this was, I was pretty young, wet behind the ears. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it worked out well. Um, yeah, some, uh, another challenge I, I, I face is, uh, right in my current position, um, I think one of the biggest responsibilities I take to heart, but also one of the biggest challenges um, is explaining uh, the things that we do in education, like assessment results, and explaining school finance in, in a way that is, in, is information that is digestible and understandable for every citizen, every person in the public. Um, and I, I work with a good team um, to do that, but I, I constantly think of how do we frame what this issue is or what this, what these results are, um, and how do we explain it in a way that's understandable. So that's a daily challenge. Okay, the next question is actually from me. Uh, please describe your process for arriving at budget priorities using some examples of unpopular or difficult budget decisions you've had to make in the course of your administrative career? Well, budgets are all about priorities, um, whether it's state or local or uh, I, what I, you know, part of, um, I come to you with a little bit of untraditional, I, I'm not a sitting superintendent someplace, but none of the other candidates are. I, I did work, I worked and was responsible for school budgets at a big high school. Um, what, you know, 
what you'd look at would be student needs, student interests. Um, what so therefore, I think those those hit both what students need to advance their work, but also what students need to challenge their work is the student interest piece. Um, and this is at a high school level. Uh, we'd look at um, priorities about uh, what infrastructure issues to be able to deliver those services we might have in that fiscal year. We'd look at um, all kinds of things around the other types of services we have. Um, and um, we'd make some tough decisions about uh, class sizes, about how many sections to run, about um, who gets new books this year and who doesn't, um, or now technology. Um, you know, some of the big ticket items of if, if there was, I, I wrote some grants. We did a, uh, we, did a, we won a smaller learning community grant for um, a few million dollars from the feds. That's always nice. You know, Christmas doesn't come often, but we hope it can. Um, and so it's, it's, you know, you, you beat the door on those kind of outside funding streams. But at the end of the day, um, work with department chairs a lot on this, work with the school community. I think part of, part of building a budget is having an openness um, about, you know, what, what the bottom line is in terms of what there is in terms of revenue that you can use for, uh, and this is education, of course, and, um, and then, you know, what are the, and it has to be driven a lot by what are the uh, goals, school improvement goals are they, or are they district improvement goals, and how do you advance those? Um, and then I think that the third thing is, uh, like I, well, the first thing really, like I said, we're, we're kids needs and interests, um, but the, the combination of those three things plus <coughs> what are the resources that have been provided to the schools by the public. Next question is from Mr. Howard Moore. Hello. Um, the question is, as superintendent of the Northampton Public Schools, what would you see as your role in defining the district's vision for educational excellence? Well, I, first of all, um, the superintendency is really fundamentally, and this is what I you know, teach graduate students too on this, uh, as well, and it, I, I talk to them about, and they are superintendents for aspiring superintendents. Superintendency is really about being a visionary. I mean, you have to be a systems leader. So it's, it, there's a lot about making sure the management issues and making sure, you know, buses run on time and all that, but there's, there are management processes you need to put in place because you need to, you need to be really freed up to be the active visionary moving forward um, a district plan, district goals. Um, I think what I, I, I guess I'd fall back when I think about what my idea of a vision for Northampton schools would be is um, what my core beliefs are. And that, that, that really is why, um, you know, why I came out this far um, about this opportunity is I think that there's a lot that Northampton is about and that the Northampton schools are about that match up with my core beliefs. And so in terms of vision that I would, um, that I would really look to uh, aim at. You know, one piece of that would be you know, a serious commitment to equity um, in terms of meeting all students' strengths and needs, um, both in what their career choices are and what, what they want to do after high school, but also in life. And to do that, um, there's really got to be to do that kind of commitment to equity, there's gotta be an identification and um, a removal of institutional barriers that stand in the way of, of delivering that. Um, that's a core belief that would be part of a vision. I think the, another one is, you know, we have to have a focus on, on teaching, learning, and on leadership. Uh, you know, the, the, there has to be a focus on leadership at the school level, leadership um, at the team, at the grade level, um, that's important. At student leadership, I kind of I take res I take uh, seriously the voice of kids uh, and the voice of uh, those who, as they get older, aren't, we don't call them kids anymore. Um, that's important. Um, another piece is uh, there has to be an emphasis and a focus on systemic improvement. 
And again, I think I said this already. I, I, I really don't believe that when we talk about improvement and systemic improvement, that's all about not everything rests on the teachers and principals in our schools, that there needs to be um, district action, system action that um, makes sure that the students have what they need and that their teachers have the tools that, as best as we can provide and really as, as much as we can focus them um, on, on that. Um, another part of that, that vision would really be focusing this continuous improvement, which you have to really look at for whatever you're running now. Um, it has to be based on data and it has to be focused on the results. You know, we, I, I talked a little bit about some of the data and some of what I've seen um, in the results. Um, I think it's important, we talked about entry plans, great first question. And that's um, some of the listening and some of the engagement that whoever the new superintendent is um, gets, gets involved in, um, is, is looking at the data, is focusing on the results, and it's, it's taking what the district's improvement goals are and working and meshing that into the school goals and advancing that, but it's basing it though on what's going on in the classroom. Um, I guess the last thing is uh, I'd have a vision for um, collaboration. I mean, it's gotta be, you can't, um, you need to build community support for the schools. You, know, you need to collaborate across you know, and actually, I, I, it's, it's it's very interesting. You know, the, the mayor is uh, as the chair of the school committee. That's that's an investment of the government of this locality, and you know, obviously it's a structural thing. I understand, that, but it's a real investment um, that's visible into the schools. Um, collaboration, though, is also with educators. Um, it's with you know, it, it's across with parents and with community members. It's with different nonprofits in the area, it's with foundations possibly, it's with certainly colleges and universities in the area. Um, and so when I think about you know, visions, I think about what, what are my core beliefs in terms of how we advance learning and, um, and a collaborative focused educational environment would be part of that vision. Thank you. The next question comes to you from Mr. Alden Bourne. Good evening. Um, Good evening. You, you touched a little bit about um, working to gain support for the uh, public schools and what groups you'd focus on. I guess um, the part of the question that still would be left is how would you specifically work to get these groups um, behind us? You know, from the business groups to the right. parents to the community leaders and kind of how would that, the nuts and bolts of how you would execute well, on that, I guess. I think that, that that's part of that, that entry cycle is, um, is whoever the superintendent is, um, needs to find out what the most important breakfast table is for whatever group it is in town. Um, you know, whether it's Rotary or whatever, you know, Lions Club or whatever that looks like, needs to um, really be, uh, open up pathways to the local chamber of commerce, um, needs to, you know, be in those, those discussions, um, needs to um, work with um, and, and really uh, develop good working relationships that may already exist with social service agencies, with nonprofits in town, with um, advocacy, ad advocacy groups for uh, students of color, for, um, uh, for kids and families living in poverty. Um, needs to, I'd say also, you know, this is also Northampton needs to build up um, relations with uh, folks in the arts and in music. Um, there's some, you know, the YMCA here. It's, you know, it's just, there's lots of, I'd, I'd say, um, work to be done by whoever steps into this job because I, you know, I, I feel important. Um, this is me. Uh, you know, I, I don't jump around from job to job, um, and I really feel committed to engagement in whatever community I, I live in, and um, and so, you know, I'd, I'd come in um, looking to actively engage. Um, uh, leadership, but as well, as well though, people who just are interested in schools. You know, um, of course, maybe help, a little help from the mayor might help too. I, I think he probably knows a few people around town. Um, 
Okay, the next question is uh, from Mr. Zahowski. Could you share with us what is the perception of your leadership style in your current uh, place of work? Mm -hmm. okay, I think they'd, folks would say, um, it's always one, it's one of those like self-reflective kind of questions here, right, where you have to think about it. Um, I'd say, I think they'd say he's a pretty open, collaborative guy. Um, I think they'd say um, doors open, he's visible, he, he's engaged. Um, I, I have to, and what I do now, um, part, you know, it's, it's like there's a lot of research on uh, building principles um, and, and superintendents where they, this one study that pointed to building principles making 90 decisions a minute. Sorry, an hour. Nine decisions. I mean, it'd be tough. Um, I don't think a hummingbird could pull that off. <laughs> but uh, nine decisions an hour. That's the mayor, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, what I, what I, I'm pretty, I'm very used to fast-paced uh, work environment. I'm, ver I'm very used to politics. Um, politics that is refreshing and open and good, and politics that's ugly and dirty, um, and all those in between. Um, I, uh, I'm very used to, uh, you know, to working um, and building coalitions um, with all kinds of, of folks, um, uniting today around this important issue when we may have disagreed on something two weeks ago. Um, I think that, you know, you could ask the state superintendent on down um, where I am now, that I'm a person that uh, you can trust to get the job done. And to go to on something. I mean, they, they, you know, I'm, I'm assigned all kinds of different things on, on big, big crisis issues and whatever else, um, things that, that stretch me beyond whatever thought knowledge base I had. You know, pandemic influenza. I know a lot about pandemic influenza uh, from just a few years ago. Um, hurricane response and when they evacuate people and what you do with that. Uh, so the last thing I guess I'd say you know, two things. One is. Um, I attest to having a sense of humor. Uh, I, I try to deliver it. Sometimes it works, and uh, yeah, I hope it works. Uh, and the, la the last thing is, um, I, I, I'm a pretty quick study. I mean, I, I take on and dig into issues all the time, all day long, um, all different kinds of issues. And, and quite honestly, I like it. I like the intellectual exercise of it, but I also like to, like to make sure we do a good job. The next question comes to you from uh, Ms. Blue Duvall. Hi. Hi. Uh, looking at your resume, could you explain the professional choices you've made along the way? Good question. Well, I started off with college. I won't keep going, you know, I'll do a little bit about that. But uh, so just out of college, um, one professional choice was um, uh, moving to Middletown, Connecticut to work for Wesley University uh, because my girlfriend was there, mm -hmm. who later became my wife. Um, I think that was a good choice. Um, another one, the next one was uh, really uh, in, in Middletown. So I talked about wanting to be a teacher. Um, made a connection that was fantastic uh, that they let me teach night school. Um, and they let me teach night, night school for credit uh, to kids. Um, and when I say kids, these are, I think when you get enough gray hair, I guess you call 19 year olds kids. and. Uh, Folks who 18 to 25 years old, um, either trying to get credits or trying to get um, literacy skills, as, as teaching grammar, English grammar as well as English literature. Um, I picked Animal Farm, of course, being a you know, Russian studies kind of guy, um, and it's fantastic. You know that, that it just kind of reinforced what I what I the choice I made. I don't think it's on the on the resume because it, you get this, you know, you get to a certain length of career, you can't put everything into something, and it's just. You know, it's already too long, isn't it? Um, worked in an inner city youth program in Hartford um, that, you know, again took me out of uh, took me out of my white middle class uh, mindset and uh, made all kinds of home visits about you know my kids weren't showing up and it's a gr it's actually a pretty cool program uh, and that that all combined with everything else sent me to be a teacher in New York City um, plus the fact that. Back in the day, um, there was no Teach for America, and New York City was the place you could go when you had a BA and you didn't have any teaching credentials. So 
Um, started teaching there, loved it. I taught at Clare Barton High School in Crown Heights. Um, taught history and social studies. And after a couple of years, uh, decided, um, well, it's time for um, me to learn how to be a better teacher. Um, yeah, I know c content, but I need to be a better practitioner. And looked around, came up here a few times um, at UMass, looked at UVM, ended up in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, basically because uh, in-state tuition then was really cheap. <laughs> uh, now, of course, it's all blown up through the roof. So the, the choice that I made was that, but I always was working. Um, became a teacher out there. Um, got into teaching kids with learning disabilities um, because that was something that I thought was a need. And I thought it was, uh, it was demonstrably um, um, something that you get a lot out of. Um, built this program as learning coordinator, ended up um, principal there said, you know, you want to be a principal? I said, no, nah, I don't want to be you. No, no, I don't think so. Kept coming at me, kept coming at me. I went to grad school for that. Got a master's in that um, all while working. Um, was selected um, from my school, um, actually, in, and actually Tim Lee was there. <laughs> he uh, was an assistant principal at a school I taught at in Madison. Um, was selected um, for the Grow Run Principals Program uh, by the school district. It was the first year of that program. Uh, they had had it back in the 70s and they saw a real need to, to really um, shape education leaders. Uh, it was a full-time, it was a fantastic program. Full-time uh, release from the classroom all year long and they tied it to professional development through education leadership courses at UW-Madison and they tied it to action research project that was based on what you were doing and they had you work in multiple schools. Um, with mentors. Um, was hired by one of those folks uh, as assistant principal. While I was at West, there were four head principals. Uh, my mentor ended up getting elected state superintendent. Uh, the context in Wisconsin, and is a context I have to quickly give you, is uh, the state superintendent of public instruction is a nonpartisan elected official. There is no board of education at the state level. And this constitutional officer does not report to the governor um, or the legislature. They independently run um, public instruction. Now, of course, the governor legislature runs statutes and budgets. So that's a big impact on, on the daily life. But she was elected state superintendent, and she asked me to come and uh, be, be her communications director, uh, build out a program, uh, and also run the uh, publications of curriculum guides, uh, the writing of standards, that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, um, also run the teacher year program and just, you know, they keep adding, it's always fun. Um, and, and also be a policy advisor um, in the state superintendent's cabinet. Uh, and, that's, and, and that's been a lot of, a lot of fun. Um, it's, uh, it, again, was, I hadn't, didn't have the training in media relations and uh, in the training in public information, uh, but it's, uh, I like challenges. I mean, it's, it, I also got into a lot of, um, how we build budgets, you know, talk about priorities. We would create a state budget request every year. It'd be 6.5 billion. So, you know, all kinds of different pieces, and all kinds of different initiatives. Um, and uh, really aimed at what we can do to advance learning. Um, so those are kind of the choices. Now, and today, I mean, today is coming to Northampton. Um, it is really a fundamental uh, choice I've made in a couple different levels that uh, time, it's time for a new challenge. It's time to um, to really get closer to student learning than working in the state level. Um, it's time to, uh, you know, I don't apply to lots of, you can say I don't apply to lots of jobs, I don't go all over the place. Um, I, you know, I pick, uh, Northampton's a place that I, I really see a lot of what my core values are reflected here, you know, community wise. and. Um, so it's another choice I'm hoping to make. Um, Follow-up question? Yeah. Uh, what do you think has prepared you to be the superintendent of the Northampton Public Schools? That's a good question. Um, I think there are a few things. One is um, 10 years in the classroom, uh, five years as building administrator, um, through a lot of change, through a lot of tough work. Um, 
creating innovative programs for kids that were kid focused. Uh, another thing is in the infancy, I was taking test results and looking at um, eighth graders entering and you know, who might be at risk, making sure that we built relationships with them right away. Um, I could have used that for another er earlier answer. Uh, and it's, uh, it's part of the preparation. I'd say um, my experience um, working on a lot of the uh, changes that are happening here. I mean, there's there's whole new teacher evaluation system happening uh, that I've been working on. There's a whole, you know, all the new standards are the same standards here that I've been working on. Assessment, new assessment system that's online, that's gonna be adaptive. I mean, that's all kinds of things. And, and how do you, um, how do you meet that need in technology uh, when that comes along, which comes along really soon? Uh, those, those are things I'm all very uh, cognizant of as well as practically working on. Uh, another piece of that is, uh, I haven't talked about, you know, there, there's, there's the part of me that's studied education leadership and has taught education leadership and, and um, as well as studied uh, professional development and, 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 and the payoff that gives. Um, for students, and you know, I, that all comes together. I think there's anybody who wants to take on the mantle of being a superintendent of a school has to have some inner drive. Um, I, I have an inner drive to, uh, to as I said, really do the right thing for kids in the right place. Um, I also have to uh, be cognizant of uh, my family, and uh, and this is the kind of uh, a place. Like I said, I almost lived here. 20 something years ago, and it's the kind of place that, that I think my, my family could really enjoy, and they do enjoy. We come through here. Good. I just met a friend out in the hallway a couple hours ago. Um, yeah, it's, that, that's in a nutshell where I'm coming from. Thank you. And the closing question will be from Ms. Stephanie Pick. Hi. Welcome Hi. back. Thanks. So you've had a long day moving through our school system. Now that you've spent some time here in Northampton and have met some administrators, staff, family, school committee members, what have you specifically learned about this community that would draw you here to be our superintendent? Well, first, um, I, I visit I visit I visit dozens of schools a year. That, that's actually one thing that's a great thing about what I do now is I. Um, running the teacher of the year program and, and I staffed the state superintendent um, kind of kind of like I was talking to Tracy earlier I mean she was shepherding me all over town and she had everything all ready every time every minute getting me there and and that, that that's what you do when you staff a political leader um, but I also get to meet kids and I get to see good schools and I get to see schools that face challenges not so well and I'd say the first thing off of today is there are a lot of really nice kids here, and a lot of really um, kids really who like to learn. Uh, you know, I talked to a lot of them today. Uh, one one young man gave me a, a great tour of Jackson. Um, it, it was fun. Um, second thing I'd say I learned today um, is, you know, there's there is a there is a cadre of excellent educators in this district who aren't just sitting on their excellence, but they're really, really, I think, um, good practitioners. And so I, I was in, in some great classrooms today seeing some good practice, which is important. Um, uh, I'd say that I, I was very impressed by uh, the principals you have. Um, you've had um, some turnover, and I'd say you've made some good hires. Um, you know, you, you, you back up, you know, wh whatever position I've been in leadership, um, hiring is one of the most important, if not the most important way to advance some of the goals you have in whatever system you're in. And, um, and you know, you know that today, right? You've got to make a good hire tonight. Good luck. <laughs> um, I guess those are three big things I'd say. I, the other thing I saw, I saw, one last thing, I saw, um, you know, parents, volunteering in the schools. I saw uh, teachers from, or student teachers, or folks from local colleges interested in becoming teachers. And that's, that's something that you can really make, and I think you can take Northampton a long way by getting all kinds of folks engaged in the schools. Um, from 
senior citizens through uh, somebody who's just looking at maybe being a teacher uh, to parents. Um, that auction, uh, the folks volunteering to get the auction going at Bridge School, I understand they're hoping your lunch is a big, big success, <laughs> auctioning that off. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's good to see. And I was a president of a parent-teacher organization for my kids' school, and that's, uh, that's something that I, that I value. And thank you. And lastly, do you have any questions or concerns for us about our community? I think, um, you know, I, I asked a lot of questions at the, uh, the first stage of the interview. Um, you know, the, the first question out of the bat was about an entry plan. And so I can tell it's on your mind, and I think it's a good thing, uh, no matter what you do. Um, I think, you know, you, it's uh, the most important thing, um, and I'm not going to be, I'm not here to lecture. You know, the, the most important thing for you as you move forward in the next couple of months is building the relationship with us to make sure that's a long-term viable working situation um, for the best thing. And that's what I heard somewhat today for the best thing for your schools. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough night. Unfortunately, you got the Red Sox playing right now. Uh, and, I, and I actually have a, I, I did like a lead school Red Sox day today. I'm also a lifelong fan. I, and as soon as I get out of here, I got my special World Series Champs 2004 hat that I'm be wearing all over the place. <laughs> so I'm pretty good. Uh, I, I, I think you, uh, I don't know if this was picked before you saw the World Series schedule, yeah. <laughs> but you're probably you, you might you might win an award for being the uh, the hardest working school committee in the state in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts tonight. Um, so that's all. I, I think the questions really you know it, you got a decision to make tonight, and really fundamentally I have lots of questions, um, but I think those questions come after the kind of decision you have to make. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Johnson. We appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Good night. So we'll take a five-minute recess so that we can allow uh, ourselves to reorganize for the next candidate. Good evening, and welcome back to the special meeting of the Northampton School Committee for October 23rd, 2013. We're coming out of a recess uh, between our second and third uh, superintendent of schools interview. Um, and the next candidate uh, that we will welcome to interview this evening is Lori Farkas. Welcome. Thank you. Um, and we have a series of questions that have been assigned to each of the school committee members. And the opening question will come to you from the vice chair, uh, Mr. Ed Zuhowski. Good evening. Good evening, Ed. Uh, well, you've had a chance to see some of Northampton. And, you, uh, and to learn about our school department. So if you could please describe to us what your entry plan would be as the new superintendent of schools. And if you could be specific about how you would develop a plan of action, whom you would include in that task, and how you would communicate your plan. Okay. If you need me to repeat that, I can too. Okay. Um, describing my entry plan would be to examine more thoroughly the budget to look at how we've allocated resources between schools and in terms of programs and different levels of service, both for uh, based on student need as well as um, as well as numbers of population and different types of population within our individual schools, um, to create a plan. Um, regarding staffing out for the next couple of years, kind of like a strategic plan, but not using that whole strategic plan process. Um, so that plan would be for budget and staffing. And then in um, intertwined with that, to look in depth at curriculum and aligning curriculum between elementary schools um, in terms of our level three status or the, the district's level three status um, with 
specific care to create and um, develop curriculums, uh, map curriculums that address the varying needs of students. Um, in addition to those two uh, kind of combined things, I would see um, working with the community of Northampton to share more information about who makes up our student body and um, how that student body has changed over time and why our needs are changing over time and what we could project out in terms of those needs, both curriculum, staffing, funding in those areas. So those are the major primary areas that I would want to address right away or in a reasonable amount of time. The people that I would see working with me on that are all of the, the current administrative team, the principals, um, the uh, curriculum director, the, the um, business director, and I'm trying to think those are the major people who would work with me. I would also want to solicit information from teachers. Uh, certainly the teachers would be part of the curriculum development piece and, um, and ultimately the implementation of the curriculum. So they would be essential in looking at the curriculum in greater depth. Thank you. The next question will come to you from Mr. Michael Flynn. Right. Speaking of curriculum, uh, how will you assess the effectiveness of the current curriculum? describe the process you would use to make changes in the curriculum, including how you would oversee implementation of the changes, and what role does assessment play in the process? Well, certainly our outcomes are assessed um, on a state level by MCAS, and, um, and that will be changing in the, in the near future, too. Um, and by our other indicators that the state measures us on, However, implementing the curriculum and looking at our own um, progress in implementing the curriculum, from my perspective, needs to be done a couple of ways. Um, first of all, I think our teachers need more extensive and a deeper level of training if we're going to implement a curriculum uh, effectively. And as part of that training, we need to know how to use progress monitoring and how to be able to give ourselves feedback on an ongoing and consistent and standardized way if students are making effective progress. And if we're implementing the curriculum in a way that makes sense for all students or uh, yeah, all students in a classroom or in a school. Um, we've started to look at that. The district has started to look at that using AmesWeb, which is a great progress monitoring tool, and, and using that throughout our elementary schools and to a certain extent at the middle and high school, which are, is a great, great tool to use because we get data back on a regular basis in a way that's easy for people to interpret. Um, can you repeat the rest of your question? I'm sorry, Mike. Sure. No, no problem. Uh, so describe the process you'd use to make changes in the curriculum, including how you'd oversee implementation of the changes, and then what role does assessment play in the process? When changing curriculum and implementing curriculum, um, it's not just about that the training or training followed by coaching, which I really think is essential, but it's also ongoing investigation into the curriculum and its implementation. One of the things that I would take that I learned from Hampshire is ongoing meetings with um, both grade level and then um, articulation groups between elementary and middle and middle and high to make sure that we're teaching the curriculum in a linear way, that we're using a lot of the same language, that we're assessing for, for the same benchmarks, that we're carrying those benchmarks through to the next levels and in ways that make sense to children and that make sense for learning. Um, those, those meetings, those trainings, those ongoing sessions with teachers, like I said, grade level wise, in between grades and in between schools and also based on subject areas have to be ongoing or else our curriculum loses its liveliness and loses its relevancy on a day-to-day -day basis for teachers. The next uh, question will come to you from Mr. Downey Meyer. Question 
is how should professional development be connected with the evaluation of teachers and administrators? In order to evaluate teachers, the only, from my perspective, it is only fair that we offer strong, consistent, logical, planned professional development, or else we're not doing our job as administrators. And so if we want teachers to teach in the best way that they know how and to evaluate them on what is now a very extensive high stakes kind of evaluation, um, we need to be providing for them and serving them as educators for them. And so we need to be providing thoughtful, <coughs> relevant, ongoing pro professional development that includes coaching, that includes that follow-up session and that, that time where a teacher can reflect with someone who's shared information or can get feedback from someone who's shared information. Thanks. The next question will come to you from Mr. Andrew Shelfa. Can you please describe the ways you believe technology can be used to enhance academic achievement and how have you used technology to enhance individual student achievement? How have I personally used it? Yes. Technology is, is a primary tool that uh, I would uh, assume and, and believe that most professionals sitting in this room are using on a daily basis. Our students are pretty adept at using this technology and in this district we need to meet them where they are and in lots of ways we are not there yet and we need to look at our technology which we have been doing um, I, I believe in a planned and logical way and taking steps to, to make sure that technology is available in our classrooms because it's a tool, and it's a tool that we use every day in our work, and they need to, to learn to use it as a tool, not as an add-on or something, uh, a way to just present a PowerPoint, but as a tool just like I learned to use a pencil. Um, in special education, and in many aspects of special education, technology is part of what I manage every single day. Students um, with, we are in an age where students with uh, some very specific disabilities are able to bypass and, and um, address those through the use of amazing technology, whether it's personal FM units or cochlear implants or um, iPad being used for everything from augmentative communication to um, addressing students with low vision needs. And so I, it, in my current position, um, I see that tool being used all the time and I see the demand for it um, because it's essential for students, not only with some of those physical um, needs that I just mentioned, but students who struggle with a learning disability and struggle with reading and writing. Um, we have ways, there are plenty of students at high level colleges who do not read, who use technology to go through their academic uh, career without being able to access that particular skill. And um, we're at a disadvantage when we don't, when we can't share that with every student. Um, in a district and so I look forward to our teachers having the the training and then and also the access to technology to be able to do that on a daily basis and to enable students all students to access curriculum as easily you know from one student to the next thank you Thanks. The next question will come to you from mrs. Lisa Minnick would you please describe for us one of your most uh, rewarding accomplishments and what it meant to you? Um, <clears throat> let's see. <laughs> um, I'm trying to. There are a couple that I can think of right off the top of my head. Um, 
not all in a school setting. Um, as a former Outward Bound instructor, one of the courses I led was with um, vets, actually at the time, because of when I did that, it was Vietnam vets. And it was a winter course, winter mountaineering course. And um, I still remember um, some nights in the woods when there was a, um, a thaw and there, you know, how trees get covered with ice and they're cracking off branches and you're in a tent um, in, in New Hampshire. Um, but watching people, and, and I think in many ways, this, my whole, my years of working in Outward Bound inspired me about how teaching and education can really change people's lives because all of these vets had PTSD. Um, at the time, even though I was working in Maine and New Hampshire, all of those vets came from this VA hospital here in, in Leeds. And um, just to see them address their challenges in such a visual and visceral way, um, I think that, I think of students kind of doing a parallel thing every single day day, um, student, whether it's managing an emotional challenge or um, a learning disability, those that we may not see the expression of that level of feeling, but I think students feel that. And I, and I think those challenges are as emotionally and physically painful at different times for different kids as they were for those vets. So that's, that's one. <laughs> Um, now can you tell us about a challenging situation you faced in your career, how you addressed it, and the result, and what you learned from it? <clears throat> I was thinking about that because someone asked me, and it may have um, been in my interview with the Gazette, about a mistake I made and what I learned from it. And so um, I said I'd made lots of mistakes and hopefully I'd learn from them. But I think of one in particular, and it was really early on in my career. I was running um, a, a summer environmental ed program for students, and one of the staff was challenging for me. And I proceeded to march myself into the director's office and say that I couldn't work for that person. And the director told me that if I couldn't work for that person, I should just leave my job right now. And I reflected on that, obviously I did not leave that job right now, <laughs> um, but that, ha that lesson has stayed with me because as an administrator, as a colleague in any job, it is my job to figure out how to be in my job and how to work with the people around me. And I think in some ways that one incident and that one kind of drawing of a line in the sand. Um, set my tone for me it, um, because I feel like it's my job in whatever situation I'm in to come to agreement, to figure it out, to figure out a way that, um, that we can have consensus or at least come pretty close. Because if we draw those lines in the sand, we lose out in the end. And who really loses out are the kids. I have the next question. Um, please describe your process for arriving at budget priorities using some examples of unpopular or difficult budget decisions you've had to make in the course of your administrative career. Um, for me, it's always about how to get the most service for students out of the funds that exist and how to spread those funds so it's not just about special education. Even though that has been my focus for the last 11 years, it wasn't always. It was being a principal before that. So um, sometimes I look at administrative tasks and um, how, much, um, how much we get for the money invested in the administrative tasks versus how much we would get if we invested those funds in people in front of students. 
So I would say an unpopular decision I made was in this district, actually, and um, that last year I thought that we needed more special education teachers in front of students versus having educational team liaisons in all of our elementary buildings. And so I switched up um, those positions for teaching positions. Um, it meant a heavier administrative or uh, paperwork task load for some special educators or for the special educators at the elementary level, but it also meant that caseloads um, had the potential to be reduced unless the numbers went higher in, in a building. Um, so I think that was a tough decision. I don't think it was a popular decision, um, but I I am always about trying to have people in front of students. Thank you. Next question will come from Mr. Howard Moore. Hello. As superintendent of Northampton Public Schools, what would you see as your role in defining the district's vision for educational excellence? I think the district has a vision for educational excellence. I think that's what makes Northampton an attract, one of the reasons Northampton is an attractive place to live. One of the reasons Northampton public schools are an attractive place to work. What we need to do, I think, is go beyond the vision of educational excellence and support it with excellence for all students and excellence for all students as, as rigorous a level as we have it for some students. So um, in looking at the budget, which is where, where your question started, um, and kind of going back to what I said at the beginning, which is to um, really examine our budget at the same time we really examine who our school population is, it would be doing those two things together towards excellence for all students. Um, I, I'm not about taking away from, from one place in order to um, beef up or support another place. Um, so it, it's not that, but it's really finding out where we can um, build our resources, sometimes through grants, sometimes through the budget, and, um, and conversations at the city level, too, about how we support the schools. Thanks. The next question will come from Mr. Alden Bourne. Good evening. Uh, how would you work to gain support for the Northampton Public Schools? Uh, what groups in particular would you focus on and how would you get them behind us? I would see uh, a, a fairly large part of my task as educating the community, as I've said before, about who our students are today, who they might have been, um, five years ago and who they will likely be five years from now because I think that's a changing picture. Um, I also think it's our responsibility to look at the number of students who go to both charter and private schools um, and who choice into other districts and share with them in um, in a positive and assertive way what we have here in Northampton. And those that needs to happen really early in the school year because we can't think about it in the spring when we're dealing with the budget. Because charter schools make and private schools make their decisions in February and uh, in and around that time of year. So if we can show the fabulous art and, and theater programs that are going on in the high school, even if three students decide to come to Northampton High as opposed to going to a charter school, that's, that's um, a great thing for the high school. And similarly, at the elementary school, um, we have a lot of great creative things going on in our elementary schools. We need to invite parents in, not just on parent night in September for the people who already have their children in our schools, but at other times to show to share what we have going on here. Um, so that is, that's one way I think we can, I see really making a difference um, and reaching out to the community. But really it is too about sharing who our students are going to um, 
being present in the community, as present as I am in, in all of our schools on a daily basis, which is every day, all the time, um, I expect to be out in the community a lot. Can I just ask one? Sure. Oh. Who are, I mean, you keep talking about it. you want to make it clear who our students are, who they've been, and who they'll be in five years. Could you just spend I, a We have a lot. Oh, I'm sorry. Should I not right speak? No? Um, you asked, so yeah. one minute. <laughs> one minute. Okay. Um, we have more ELL students, English language learners, every year. Um, we have a greater number of students with a high level of medical need every year. We have more families in crisis. Last year we looked at the number of uh, times we called crisis services in the community, the number of kids that we had go to hospitals and who went to partial hospitalization at Bay State. That, that, those numbers are increasing on, on a daily basis, not a daily, a, a yearly basis. So. So there, there's a shift, and whether it's a shift based on the national budget crisis or, or what it is, what it's related to, I can't say, you know, I'm unequivocally, but I, I see that change in all school districts. Also, the student bodies are experiencing a really high level of anxiety, all kids, all ages, not just teenagers, but little kids, and that, that's changed in schools over the time. So it's not just Northampton, it's public school settings. Okay, the next question will come to you from Mr. Ed Zahowski. Could you um, share with us what uh, the perception is of your leadership style in your current district of Northampton? My current district. <clears throat> I believe the perception, and it's always a challenge for administrator because you don't always know um, exactly what, what folks are thinking or saying, but I believe the perception is that I'm collaborative. That's my first choice. The interesting thing about being a student services director or special ed director is that technically you really have no power in and of yourself, except in some very few regulatory areas. And so all of my work has to be collaborative. I have to collaborate, collaborate with building principals, um, certainly with the colleagues that, um, that share the responsibilities that I have every day, the special education supervisors. Um, but I also have to collaborate with parents. So I, I believe that's my first, my first, the first place I turn in my leadership. At the same time, um, I think also people know that I'm not afraid to make a decision. I, I try to gather the information I need from the people I feel who are experts or engage in conversations with, um, with the folks who will need to ultimately carry out a decision and then if, when I need to make a decision, I do. Sure. Okay. Um, the next question will come to you from Ms. Blue Duvall. Looking at your resume, could you explain the professional choices you have made along the way? Um, okay. uh, because my resume is a little different, um, I have not been, you know, an educational administrator or a building, uh, building-based teacher. So I started out in the outdoors because that was my first love, from Girl Scouts. And, um, and so I started out as an environmental educator and um, that kind of got mixed around with many years working for Outward Bound. Um, that's not a particularly sustainable lifestyle. And, um, and so, um, I, but at the same time I was doing a lot of mountain rescue work and teaching mountain rescue. So that's why I went in uh, to physician's assistant school. Um, at one point. And while I love medicine, and um, it, it's very exciting for me, I realized after two years of PA school and, and being successful and finishing that um, really it, it wasn't something that I wanted to do full time. Um, at that point, I moved to Massachusetts and um, 
ran an out of district placement called the EWT school, which is a school for emotionally disturbed kids. It used to be in uh, the north end of Springfield. And I started my career in special education in the mid 80s in this state. So that, um, once I started that, I my focus at that point was to become a special education administrator and or a principal. And I kind of went back and forth and did both of those for a number of years. And I had all, at somewhere along the line, I decided my end point was going to be superintendent. Okay, well, that goes into it's the second. It's not a road well traveled. <laughs> what do you think? has prepared you to be the superintendent of Northampton Public Schools? Learning that hard work and focus can, can make a difference. Learning that um, when we work together, whether it's um, rowing a boat or, or, or being in a winter mountaineering session, setting or working with emotionally disturbed kids, we can change lives and that education changes lives. And there is really nothing else that I have done in many ways for my whole career as an adult. So I see my work in all these various places as adding little bits to my skills in preparing me to be a superintendent. Certainly, having worked as an educator, as an administrator in this state for the last, well, whatever, since 1986, um, I have an understanding of the demands of the state, how to work with all the various pieces, not all, but many or most of the various pieces required on a daily basis by an administrator, whether it's grants or reporting documents or um, the new evaluation system or the new requirements for training for, administra um, for all teachers in English language learners. So I'm really familiar with all of those things. I think I bring that as a very strong base to being a superintendent in, in any district, but in this district. In addition, um, because I've taught and led at various levels with various populations over the last almost 30 years, um, I think I can bring that experience to bear on being a superintendent. Um, it's not just I was a principal here or at that level. I've been a principal at a lot of levels. I've run buildings. I know the demands. I know that how, how hard it is and also what a wonderful thing it is. And at the same time, having been a special education administrator, I, I bring those pieces too. So I think all of those things have worked together to prepare me for this step. Thank you. Thank you. Closing question will come to you from Ms. Stephanie Pick. I'll put you through a long day. Um, so <laughs> the, the wording on this is a little different for somebody um, who is an internal candidate. But now that you've spent some time in Northampton and have been with our administrators, staff, families, and school committee members, what have you, what have you specifically learned about this community that would draw you here to be our superintendent? Um, I know that this is an incredibly dedicated community of educators, a really dedicated and collaborative group of administrators who are willing to jump in and do whatever is necessary to make things work, to address a problem, um, to make things better for students. And all of our administrators are about students and that and I find that um, to you know one it makes me want to work with them even more in whatever capacity um, and I love the students here I, I you know I am committed to this community I've been here for almost 30 years um, I wasn't born here I was born in New Jersey but I'm not going back and so um, I am I I see Northampton as my home 
and I like seeing it as my work home too. And finally, what questions or concerns do you have for us about our community? Um, it's an interesting question to pose from you because like my interview, I would want to say, how do you work together and how do you see things, wanting to make things different or the same? Where do you want to make change? Where do you want to build on a strength? And I know you're leaving, so it's funny that you asked that question, but and, um, I think you have spent many years on this school committee. And, um, and I know looking around this table, um, there are other people who have spent many, many years on this school committee. Um, but the question, because we would have to work together, is where do you want to build and where do you want to change? I mean, is that a question that we owe her an answer? I took that as more of a rhetorical question, I think. So okay. I, unless, you're, unless you would like us to all... No, I mean, try. I guess I... I don't have a specific question about the community because I live here. I'm different than some of the other candidates. I would love to hear an answer, but that could come at another time. Well, Ms. Pick, if you'd like to try to answer the question, you can. Oh, goodness. I, I, I wasn't prepared to be interviewed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. So, so you're asking what, I mean, I, where you think school committee wants to build, where we want to, where we want to go. Um, it's, it's interesting because we started our evening off today by reading um, the profile that we had written for what we're looking for in a superintendent. So I think where we want to go is trying to, to bring somebody into the leadership position um, as superintendent who will um, try to meet the goals of that profile and help us move forward to you know, somebody who's going to come in and recognize what our strengths are and where we need to grow and what our challenges are, what we need to work on and find the best way to do that um, for our community. Um, so certainly some of it, as, as you've already mentioned, is around curriculum and it's about educating the community and it's about um, building a collaborative culture in the schools. So I think right now the, the focus is going to be in helping a new superintendent enter the district in the best way possible to meet the needs of our students and our staff. Thank you. That's my, my two cents. Well, thank you very much. That, that concludes the interview. We appreciate it. Um, and I will uh, call a five minute recess um, and then we will move into a, uh, actually we'll, we'll, we'll be in recess now for quite some time because we'll have an opportunity for um, school committee members to remain here and to review um, some of the feedback sheets that we've received throughout the day. Um, so that's the next allotted piece of the agenda uh, that we'll move into now. October 23rd, 2013. Uh, we're reconvening from an extended recess uh, to our special meeting. Um, just to bring you up to speed, we've uh, finished the three interviews with the three candidates, and the committee has just spent the last approximately 45 minutes uh, reviewing uh, the written surveys that were completed by the various stakeholder groups that met with the candidates. Uh, we now have time on our, menu, on our agenda for deliberation. So I, um, I guess I want to be clear uh, sort of uh, what, we, um, what was said at the outset. Um, obviously, as we deliberate and as we talk about interviews and, and talk about um, things that we uh, may have reviewed in the forums, if we also just maintain the, the idea that these are all professionals um, and that we want to, this is a somewhat unusual situation to have an interview interviews conducted like this on live television obviously it's part of our legal process but just to keep that in mind as we uh, as we discuss the candidates um, and uh, and be mindful and respectful of that so 
Um, I'm not sure how the uh, committee wishes to proceed. Um, I can certainly just open the floor for discussion. Mr. Schell. I want to I want to start with a, with a question. What are our options slash goals for this evening? Okay. Uh, I think that one of the questions that has come up is does it make sense for us to be voting on a candidate for tonight? Uh, so if we don't do that, what would happen um, is one of my questions. And if we were to say, well, we need a few days to get some more input on these three candidates, that's one path. Or also, what is the other path that says, um, if we don't like any of these candidates, what are our other options going forward? I'm just curious about how that would all. Lots of options. Um, certainly, uh, uh, and, I, and I received several inquiries about the, folk, the fact that we had a vote on the agenda. Um, that was clearly to reserve the right if the school committee wanted to do that. Um, and obviously, as with any of our votes um, that are on an agenda, we always have the ability to postpone those votes, um, to postpone the deliberation. Um, so one scenario could be a postponement to allow for further deliberation, et cetera. Uh, certainly, a scenario that's not unprecedented would be if of the candidates there was a clear feeling that one of the candidates uh, or more or one of the candidates um, uh, uh, was not right fit for the job um, but there were still some deliberation needed on the remaining two that's an option um, and then obviously uh, you know various scenarios but obviously if there's a concern that none of the candidates meet the concern that would be a, a something for a discussion as well um, it, and, and obviously that's not unprecedented in, in our process. Okay. So pretty much uh, this is the school committee's decision as a body and, uh, and we can make it on whatever time frame uh, the body feels most comfortable. Okay. So are there any thoughts or comments about the process about? Could I just elaborate on what you just said, which to the just to the extent that if we chose if we decided that none of the candidates that we've seen this evening were the perfect fit for us and we did decide to delay a dis or to postpone a decision until some I would think that we would probably be doing another search beginning early next year and looking to hire next spring early summer late summer something like that so you know it, it Thankfully, we have an interim superintendent who seems comfortable in the position and who seems willing to stay. But that's one of the factors in deciding not to make a decision on these candidates. Sure. Okay. And I didn't mean to step on your toes, but that is, am I correct about that? That we would Certainly, we could, uh, again, I mean, everything. We could do the search anytime we wanted to. Yes. It would make more sense, I think for us to go in a time frame that's what's typical for districts so that we have a larger pool of candidates. That's definitely an, that's definitely an option. Um, Ms. Pick? So, um, actually, before I address all of this, I, I just also wanted to acknowledge um, Regina Nash and the central office staff and all of the administrators for the job that they did for planning for today and executing today. It was an enormous amount of work. We're aware of that. and we really want to thank you and obviously our administrators are very invested they're still sitting here waiting to see what we're what we're doing but uh, um, it's a very complicated day that the candidates were taken through and I, I just thank you so much for, for all that you did to arrange it and um, implement the day um, so we saw a lot of commentary in here about please don't <coughs> rush don't make a decision tonight and I think Andrew asked a very good question in terms of if we don't make a decision tonight what does that mean that we're using the time for so you know if, if somebody says um, they're writing a comment don't rush so that you can hear from community members but the community um, are, are there a lot of community members watching tonight we don't know um, obviously the people who have already the community members who were present we've already heard from um, I just if, if we're going to take more time, which I'm certainly, certainly willing to do, um, I want to know that it, it's going to be useful, that the information is going to get out there, that we're, we want to hear what people have to say, that they've heard the interviews. Um, 
so that we can that we're using that time well because of course these candidates are waiting um, to hear. I did speak to Joe Wood, our facilitator, the other day and asked him some questions that I thought that we might have tonight in terms of, you know, what are the risks if we don't make a decision tonight? And I asked him, do you happen to know if any of these candidates are, you know, engaged in, uh, you know, the end stage of another search right now? And he did not think that anybody was involved in a, um, or anywhere close to being at the end of a search. So that he, he thought that, th while there's always some risk by delaying a decision, that um, that he didn't think that we were at great risk <coughs> in this case if we were to take a couple of extra days, um, but that they that we do need to be in touch with them tonight or tomorrow morning to let them know what the process is so they know when they're going to hear something so that we would need to make a decision about when we're meeting next. Um, the other thing that I wanted to comment on is that there were a number of comments from all the different. Um, constituencies talking about how we that Northampton deserves to have somebody who is a seasoned superintendent and as a committee I think that we've actually commented on the fact that given our salary range it's very unlikely that we're going to attract a seasoned superintendent um, I'm, I'm trying to think back at the, the 16 applicants that we had and I I don't think that we had a single one correct me if I'm wrong Adam looking at you um, and th and while I'm certainly willing, if this is what the, de the the body decides, is to wait till the spring, we need to understand that we're going to be, so while there may be sitting superintendents who are looking, that we're also competing with a lot more districts in the spring. There are very few districts doing searches right now. There will be a lot in the spring. So I don't want us to make a decision because of that. You know, I don't want us to, to rush a decision tonight because of the, but just to be, to put it in perspective that um, waiting till the spring puts us at some other risk in terms of the districts we're competing with as well. Ms. Minnick. The other side of that though, I think is that if, if, if we think we can afford a sitting superintendent, it would be very difficult for those people to, to, to make the decision to leave their jobs right now. At this point in time in the year, right. they would be abandoning a district in the middle of the year. So it's more likely that we've gotten applications from people who are not the superintendent. I think that in, a, in the more traditional transition time, we might have more opportunity to get an application from someone who has superintendent experience. I'm not saying that's the perfect fit for this community, but I'm just, you know, but she's right. We'll also, there are, will also be more competition to attract those candidates to other districts. So, I mean, it's, this is all just a um, uncertain, uncharted territory. Mr. Bourne. Uh, Stephanie, you asked um, a little bit about who else we wanted to hear about. Um, um, you know, would we actually hear from other community members? And I still want to hear more from the all team than um, just looking through these forums about their take on the candidates. I mean, if we're going to really consider one of these three people, I'd like to hear more from them, which I had the opportunity to do when we looked at Brian. So, um, How did we do that? Refresh my memory. How did, we get How did we have more feedback? We had a week between the interview and, yeah. and the, the meeting where we decided. Right. We also made calls, actually. And we assigned, we assigned yes. people to we make called calls communities. to someone in the government. Yeah, I mean, this, you know, this question about um, you know, what's, your, what, what's your leadership style in your district? I mean, it seems like a question to ask to people in a district. I don't know if we've had time to do that. But I mean, what are people going to say? People think I'm a jerk? I mean, <laughs> So there, there is other information that I have from Joe. So um, Ed and I were Very remembering honest. that last time around. <laughs> Ed and I were remembering that the, the last time around we did make calls to the districts. We, we divided the candidates up and we called school committee members and administrators and um, town officials if people reported to um, a town council or something like that. Um, and I asked Joe, I said, you know, we, we didn't do that this time. And while he can't share specific information, what he can tell me is that he's, he's made um, a lot of phone calls on all of our candidates and felt strongly that, um, that we had um, chosen three people who had very valuable experience, who could, who could um, perform mm -hmm. the job, and that he did not hear anything about any of them that was a red flag to him <coughs> that he wanted to pass on to us. And I, I have every faith that he would have told me if there were any red flags. So I did just want to pass that on. It's not the same as making our own phone calls and getting that information ourselves. And we can certainly choose to do that. Did you, 
Um, yeah, just to echo, there was, um, before I came into this meeting, I'd been contacted about the pace and about whether we were being deliberate enough and reading through these um, really from the stakeholders, there seems to be that same sense. I thought that it was useful to have the time even just to deliberate personally over the information that I've extracted from these evaluations. Um, I think that we could make a more thoughtful choice given that time. Um, I would agree that we could make a more thoughtful choice over that time. However, I think that what we're also looking at is whether or not we, um, the importance of whether or not somebody has experience or not having experience. And, and I understand that if we open up the search, again, we might end up, because of the money that we're putting out there, um, with similar results, um, with nobody having superintendent experience. But um, Dr. Nash had said something about to me about um, having worked at Frontier and being a regional school and how difficult it was, but it didn't compare to the complexities of Northampton. And I really think that um, we should consider looking at the salary and going back and saying if we need to, if we need to adjust the salary to meet the needs that we have. I mean, we've already spent $5,000 on this search if we had put it towards our priority. I and mean, we have to decide, are we being penny wise and, pool and pound foolish? And oh, I wanted to, um, the alt. I'm not quite sure how much more, I mean, of all of the different groups that I read, the alt um, team had an awful lot of specifics that they said. And I just wanted to quote a couple things that didn't have to do about any body in particular. But um, it says it's hard to gauge. Um, the process seems rushed, and it's not a good process. Process it seems rushed, um, and are we settling for the sake of a hire? Somebody else said that, um, and we can't afford to train on the job. And a couple of different people said we can't afford to do that, and the district cannot afford to hire a candidate who has not been a superintendent. They also said specific things about each of the candidates, both pros and cons, as far as what could work, but. The overall consensus that I've been getting is that um, while they all have wonderful experience, do we really want to take the time now to train somebody and who, I mean, are, aren't we looking for a leader to come in and, and take us by the hand instead of us having to take that person by the hand and, and teaching them and following the ropes and everything else? So, um, and. I'm relatively new, and having worked with um, Superintendent Salzer, who I absolutely love and thought he did a wonderful job, I also think he was a diamond in the rough that we were very lucky to get somebody like that. But I can also see um, how having a superintendent with experience is different, and it, um, the way the decisions are made. I mean, it's, it's really hard to say, but, and I don't want to get into the specifics, but just from my position, I can tell a difference in the decisions being made by, and the ease and the confidence of making the decisions um, with an experienced superintendent. And the fact that we respected her enough to hire her, and she says that you know Northampton is more complicated in a lot of different ways, um, I just think that I don't want to rush the process, but I'm also, I'm not happy with um, the field of candidates for, because I do believe that uh, we need a superintendent, someone that has some superintendent experience. And my experience on the um, principal search team out in at Ryan Road and talking to the teachers, they didn't want a buddy, they wanted a leader. They wanted somebody to come in and could take and, and there was already strong leadership at that school, so it wasn't like they were asking for, they just wanted somebody who was a leader. They didn't want a friend. They, they wanted somebody who could come in and hit the floor running. And um, we don't have anybody in our, in our pool that can do that, even though they don't have experience. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Moore? Um, I agree that those are important things to talk about, and um, I, think, I think it would be really wise 
set aside time to do that in, in a early next week, for example, um, that would give us time to think about all those things, to think about um, you know, the value of experience um, versus um, the realities of our budget. Um, we've done that in a number of other positions within the district already where we, we've hired people for positions that they have not had before. And um, I think we're pretty happy with those hires. Um, so I, I, I think we have a lot to think about and um, I think it would be really smart to give ourselves a, some time to do that thinking. Um, so can I put a motion on the floor that we uh, select a date um, fairly soon. I think uh, that would be next week. Um, the earlier the better next week, I think, um, so as to give ourselves the remainder of this week and then the weekend um, to talk to people and to think about this ourselves um, and then get back together to actually um, discuss really the, th the four options, you know, is hiring one of the three people or not hiring any of the three people, so the four options that would be in front of us. And, um, and, and that's, that's my motion. Second. Got another question as to. Okay, so now discussion on the motion. Um, so what I was thinking of is that we were um, uh, hearing from these three candidates was is our job to, to pick the best of these three people, or is it to find somebody who can effectively lead our district? And I think it's the second thing. And it would be interesting for me to know how many of us saw somebody tonight who they think can be the next superintendent, because. Yeah. And I guess that's the wow. question I think we right. will be answering in a week. Right. Well, but some of us might already know. Well, that's fine. You can I mean, hold your opinion for a week. Or we could do it and continue. So right, but that's the, that's the gist of the motion. Do it, do enough so you'll, you'll vote no on the motion then if you're ready to, to make a decision. Hmm? I said, so you'll vote no on the motion if you're ready to make a decision tonight. So um, I would, I, so the motion is to, to do that, um, but I would, so the earliest we could do it is Tuesday would be the earliest because of posting requirements. Um, uh, well, we post Thursday. Um, Wednesday. It's Wednesday, not Thursday. Oh, you're right. I'm, I'm <laughs> <it's> Thursday. <laughs> so we usually meet on Thursday. So yeah, you're right. Monday would be the earliest. I apologize. I'm, I'm used to our Thursday uh, meeting. Um, so. Okay, so I guess uh, though, if we were doing that, I would like us to try to nail that down before we leave tonight. What nights are workable? Um, okay. okay. Um, other comments about the motion or other? So um, it doesn't seem to me that we're going to be ready to make a decision tonight. But it, it, would there be some value in having some preliminary discussions while the interviews are fresh in our mind? Should we? Are people up to beginning a discussion tonight? Mm -hmm. Well, that would require us, uh, I think that would require you to just temporarily withdraw the motion until, because uh, you're essentially asking us to <coughs> postpone our deliberation until next week. So Correct. if folks want to have some initial discussion tonight. Or, or we, we can vote on it. Vote I, on think it. It's, yeah, I think it's good to have some discussion tonight. Just I do too. Do less time on well, why don't discussion. we just vote on the motion then? It, it may be that, that our discussion tonight makes a different decision. We don't mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Sure, I'll withdraw the motion. Okay. So, so, okay. But it seems that if the idea was to, was to not move forward, we may, in fact, in our discussion, affect the decisions of the candidates. We may actually foreclose, if we all express one opinion, we, might, we may foreclose the opportunity for the community to participate because they will decide that we've already basically aligned ourselves. So I guess it seems to me that the, I mean, if, if we're gonna, I think I can keep the memory of the views <coughs> in my head for the four days. And, and actually, I would be more open to the input from the community that was the reason for Mr. Moore's motion. And again, it, it, I wouldn't want us to. I wouldn't want us to get in a situation where we basically, through our discussion, since we don't know where it's going to go, we, we foreclose our options. But that's just my. Opinion. What's that? But that's a valid point as well. Okay. Other thoughts on that? Well, perhaps we could discuss. Um, whether or not people just think it's important 
or not. The, the idea of, I mean, it might be moot. I mean, people might think, oh, it doesn't really matter whether or not they have experience or not. And so then, the, I mean, but if everybody decides it does matter, then, the, you know, then it would be moot. But however you all want to do it. I, I mean, I, down, I, can I, sure. I think down there is a good point. It's something I hadn't thought about. But if mm -hmm. we're going to say we want to deliberate and think and hear, then we should do that and then give it four days and we keep our options open. The key, to, the, the key is that in the, the, we understand and the public understands that the deliberation will be our own self, right. you know, deliberation, uh, right. thinking about right. it, yeah. not a deliberation right. on this body. Right. Um, so clearly if, if, if residents want to call us or send us emails or that kind of stuff, that's appropriate, but it can't be, yeah. Um, other thoughts or comments? I, I just, again, with the experience, um, <coughs> sat on the previous screening committee and, and seen the broad range of resumes that we got, we did not get more than one or two that had superintendent level experience, and one of those was a finalist. Um, several actually, or a, a number who had superintendent level experience withdrew um, during the process. So I think that it may just be the case that with our resources, I mean, you could say we can't afford to hire someone who were going to have basically start at the beginning of this process of becoming a serious superintendent, the counter might be, we may not be able to afford, at least at our current salary level, to hire someone who's a mid-career superintendent. Um, unless, unless we as a school committee make a decision to commit additional resources, and that's something we have not done to date, um, which might be something we should also, you know, again, if we, as part of this discussion going forward, we need I don't. I don't think our next superintendent has. To, I mean, I think they could have central office experience, or they could be a exceptional principal. Or I mean, I think there's a lot of different options that would be worth looking at. I don't think they have to be a superintendent. That's my take. Well, I'll make my motion again then. We'll be um, that we uh, that we put off further deliberation until we've had time to both reflect ourselves individually on what we've learned and also to be open to input from the community. Second. Okay. So do we have any idea how soon, for people who w didn't watch the interviews tonight, how fast um, they're able to download this from NCTV? Um, it's going to be a couple of days. So I would say So if we're going to do that, then um, if we is there some way that we can put out a press release to people? Please, please watch. Or if you have watched, please you know, contact your school committee members. Let us know what you think, so that um, that we can get as much. Sure, we can put a link to it on the website. We're looking for yeah. community support. Then we want to go out about that in a broad way. Um, they are planning three separate airings. Of the interviews, they're planning three separate airings of the interviews on NCTV in the coming days. Um, if you'd like to know when they are, um, oh, Monday at 8 a.m., Wednesday at 7 p.m., and Friday at 2 p.m. Okay. Well, that's Wednesday late. Wednesday Friday will be helpful. Yeah. Mm -mm. But they'll be on YouTube by. Yeah, you can find it on YouTube. They'll be on YouTube by Friday, so yeah. we can send mm -hmm. the link out to people. Exactly. Um, so maybe we can put that on our on our website and some sort of a press release that people can do that and have access we'll, to it. We'll do that. We'll we'll tweet it. We'll Facebook it. We'll do everything. <laughs> <laughs> can we make the meeting for Monday night or Wednesday? Um, Not Tuesday. Why don't we? Uh, why don't, we, why don't we, well, we can vote on the motion and then just try to figure out the logistics or if someone, if we want to try to nail down an exact day of the week so that we can let the public, public know when we're planning to do that. Um, that if, if, I don't know, if people have their calendars, Monday. Monday works for me. How about Wednesday? Wednesday. I can't, I can't do Tuesday. Thursday? It's her birthday. We can't do it Wednesday. Thursday is Halloween. <laughs> oh, 
Wednesday's, Wednesday's Halloween? Thursday. Thursday is Halloween. Thursday's Halloween next week? How about Tuesday? Oh. I could do Tuesday Thursday. Or Tuesday or Wednesday. Tuesday? How about Wednesday? I can't do Tuesday. It's your birthday. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't do Wednesday. So. Okay. We're, we're doing because of your birthday, not because of the mayor campus. We're just so you know. Might be late Tuesday. So is Mike the only person who can't do Monday? He said he can come, but late. Carlson couldn't come, Mike. I teach till seven fifteen. How about seven thirty meeting? Seven thirty meeting. Seven thirty meeting. That's a little tight from. Can't make it. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. If you drive yeah, I, I miles an hour. When I finish, I mean, I could probably be here for eight. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Give me an escort. <laughs> the light on the roof. Yeah. I can try to light class ever. I, I mean, if, if money works for everyone else, I'll. It was a walk work. that day. Yeah. I think Joe would tell us that the soonest we can do this, the better. But yeah. The other thing is, if, I mean, if we're thinking about just for these three candidates too, to be fair to them and not to keep them on the hook. Monday. We need to be respectful. Yeah. So. Uh, Let's do Monday. Monday. Monday yeah. What time are we thinking? Monday the 28th of October. Do you want to make it 7 30 so that he has no, somewhat of a chance I'll, to get over? I'll let him out early. He'll like it. <laughs> <laughs> so, what time? So I'll, I'll shoot here for 7 15 if you guys want to keep the same Regular time. time. Okay, so 7 15. Okay. Our normal start time. On Monday so the 28th. Okay, so we'll need to get that as a Monday the 28th. Okay. Yeah. Friendly amendment to the motion. So we'll reconvene on Monday. 7:15 here in the community room. Okay. Any other discussion about the motion? I have a question about the meeting, but I don't know if it's going to happen after. Okay. So th that's a special meeting. Will there be a public forum? Will people be able to make comments, or will we not be doing that? Because that, that should be known ahead of time. Too um, late. I think we should figure out another way for dealing with. Yeah. 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 Email us. I just think generally in special meetings we I, we I don't think we do that, but yeah. it it might I take an, a lot of to try to encourage people to, to do that ahead of time. Prior before. Yeah. 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 So I just think it should be very clear that in that meeting there would not be a public forum. Yeah. Okay. All right. So any other questions about the format? So pretty much we'll just resume right where we are now. Deliberation on the superintendent mm -hmm. candidates. We'll have a vote on there as just a placeholder, um, and that will be it. Do you need to vote on this? We need to vote on this. We do. Yeah, we're going to vote on this motion. I just wanted to be clear with what we were voting on. So. Assuming that this passes, what I would do is I'm going to email Joe Wood tonight so that he can contact all three candidates so that they know exactly what the process is so they're not hanging. They've, they've all been told they will hear something tonight or tomorrow morning. So, all those in favor of adopting the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so the motion carries. So, our deliberations will continue to Monday, the 28th of September. Yeah. I would also now entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion adjourn. Second. 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 All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Our special. Take those with you. Yeah. You're too oh. kind.